All righty, good evening, everyone. I am Lauren Gates, your host of this evening's special Airway Health Solutions event, our first masterclass of many, uh, titled Busting Myths and Breaking Barriers in Pediatric Airway and Orthodontic Health, with our esteemed panel of experts, Dr. Kevin Boyd, Dr. Steve Carstensen, Dr. Brett Christensen, and Dr. Ben Moralia. We are so thrilled to offer this event with free CE and recordings as part of our Airway Health Solutions fifth birthday celebration. I can't believe it's five years already. So welcome panelists and friends. We are so thrilled and so appreciative of you taking the time to help us raise awareness to help children all over the world breathe, sleep, and thrive. I'm gonna circle back with our panelists with a formal introduction prior to your presentations. Uh, but now I really wanna to get to know our audience because over 600 registered for tonight's masterclass which is it's such a great validation of the interest in that our airway health movement and the need for interdisciplinary involvement. But tonight we will fo focus mostly on the role of the dental professional as it relates to pediatric orthodontics and the realization that it takes a village to screen and help promote children's craniofacial and respiratory development. So let's go ahead and start with a poll to see who we have this evening. So this one getting to know you here, Let's say the job description that best suits me. I only have 10 options. So please don't be upset if your specific role is not there. I did the best I could with what was given. So let's see what we got here. I'll give everyone a couple of seconds. Some people are still logging on. So let's end the poll. Let's see what we got. So here are our statistics. We have 37% are dentists. We have 11% pediatric dentists, 4% orthodontists, 2% periodontists, 26% uh, dental hygienists, 4% SLPs, uh, RDH OMTs, 18%. Kudos to our dental assistant for joining us, the medical doctor, and our other healthcare professionals. So thank you, everyone. And I have another question I want to ask everybody because I want to find out what everyone's all about. Hey, Lauren, could you yeah. enable the chat for everybody, please? I'm sorry. So the, the Q&A, everyone can see. Um, sure, Gerald, can you go ahead and um, click, on, click on the chat? But you can ask your also your questions in the Q&A if you have questions, and we will enable the chat. So thank you. Our next question is, where in the world are you? Because I'm really curious if we have a global presence yet. So I did this by continent. So I have a feeling we're going to get uh, mostly North America, but let's see and find out. So where in the world is everybody? Okay. Yeah, great. And everyone could chat in um, their country. It'd be nice to see where we're all from their state, everybody. So um, our global presence, we have 2%, yay. So hopefully we can work on that a little bit, but we're thrilled to have everyone here with such interest from everywhere. It's great to see all these representation, my fellow Long Islander, wonderful. wonderful. You're from Brazil and Malaysia. I know. Right? Yep, yeah. Malaysia, there we go. <laughs> okay, yeah. wonderful to see. Even Wonderful Texas. to see. Yeah. Just a few disclaimers before and some housekeeping items. Uh, the views presented tonight are the opinions of our speaker and may or may not necessarily be affiliated with Airway Health Solutions. And the following webinar is provided for educational and informational purposes only and does not constitute providing medical advice or professional services. The information provided should not be used for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease. And those seeking personal medical advice should consult with a licensed physician or dentist. Always seek the advice of your doctor or other qualified health provider regarding a medical or dental condition. And lastly, some housekeeping items is in order to receive your CE certificate, you must be in attendance for the entire program. Zoom software attracts attendees, so we do not need a code or a survey. At the end of our presentation, we will also hold a li live digital raffle where one lucky attendee will receive a free virtual ticket to our Airway Palooza in New Orleans in March 2024. The winner, the winner must be present to win. 
So we will have uh, three presentations, excuse me, four presentations rather, and then a panel discussion at the end and answer, you know, some of the overarching questions uh, from our panelists. I did receive about 600 questions, Kevin, that I know you're going to want to dive into here. And we probably will need to do a follow-up town hall. And we just love the interest. So you keep asking questions and we'll provide answers. That's what we're here for, to provide solutions. So um, let's just come off and just talk to the panelists a little bit about just a quick introduction. Um, we're coming fresh off the ADA meeting, um, Dr. Carstensen, that you uh, monitored and it was sold out. And let, why don't you tell us a little bit about that buzz that still is buzzing since, since that meeting? Well, what was so exciting is that our speakers led the learners in the room through exercises. So they might have a role play and then the people at the tables were supposed to do something with that. And they might have something they were supposed to write down. Well, what was incredible was every time it was time for the, the learners to do something, the room was just loud and buzzy and you could see everybody engaging with somebody else. And so the energy in the room was really high. That was, you know, supplied by our excellent panels. Kevin was one of those, of course. And we had just wonderful information. And one of the highlights also was George Shepley, the president of the ADA, came down to endorse our meeting and to tell us we we're on the right track and to, you know, applaud for our, the energy and the people that were, you know, spent their time and money to come and see what can they do to make kids breathe better. And that wow. was it was just so fun to watch that through the whole room. It was, and everybody's smiling the whole time. It was great. And what another big um, kudos to you is that it was a sold out event. Yeah. So, wow, that's really something. So yeah, it's our first one since 2019 in live, you mm -hmm. know, and, and so to, to, you know, you, you always hope it's going to be great. And then sure enough, there it was Wonderful. And, and people away. So we're going to do it again next year. Not sure when yet, but it's, it's on the table. Well, great. Keep us posted on that. We'd love to get involved and help you uh, even expand that, maybe maybe live stream it, right? So we can uh, get more people on board. All right, Dr. Boyd, we are going to kick off this evening with your presentation. I'm going to go ahead and read your bio while you get go ahead and share your screen. Um, but Dr. Kevin Boyd is a board certified pediatric dentist practicing in Chicago, Illinois. He is also an attending instructor in the pediatric dentistry residency training program at Lurie Children's Hospital, where he additionally serves as a dental consultant to the sleep medicine service. He also serves as a dental consultant to Lutheran General Hospital, and he is a visiting scholar at the University of Pennsylvania's Museum of Anthropology, conducting research in anthropology and orthodontics, and we are thrilled to have him on our AHS faculty. So Dr. Boyd, go ahead, take it away, kick off Great. this meeting. Great, thanks Lauren, thanks for setting it up. Um, okay, I'm going to get right at it, you're going to watch a quick, everyone hopefully has heard of the concept of health span by now. Uh, as opposed to lifespan, lifespan, life expectancy from birth, health span, how long are you going to stay healthy into your old age? Uh, and we have a hypothesis. percent of the children born now will live naturally to over 100 years. But if we don't increase health span, what it means is that individuals are going to still succumb to cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and neurodegenerative disease at some point between their 40s and their 70s. With age, people so, face this is what I want you to look at. Time to life and health. These are two With pages that I'm going to show. Total victory over cancer. You're going to learn more about vascular disease and or dementia. We'll leave that not uh, video and quality of life. Get the link to it. There and watch the whole thing later. But I want you to see what it is that we're going to be able to do with uh, kids like this that you saw in those pictures. I, you know, what is early? I, I sort of changed the title that. Uh, Lauren had given to me for my talk uh, and just modified it. Early means under 72 months within the context of, of our uh, protocols and in our hypothesis. Uh, and it comes from the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry's definition of what is early childhood caries. That's tooth decay, any tooth decay before six years old, 72 months old. There needs to be the same moniker for malocclusion. And if I do it right, uh, I'm going to make an argument of why that needs to happen sooner than later. <clears throat> so these are, you know, my where I work, uh, private practice. I'm at Lurie, as she said, and I'm doing postdoc work at uh, University of Pennsylvania. 
this is the the consortium. This is the the course, the three day course, two and a half day course that Steve Carsonson had uh, organized with the American Dental Association. What an endorsement um, that the American Dental Association sponsored a course on pediatric airway wellness. Um, and the president, as Steve said, came in much to everybody's surprise and not only gave a nice, what I thought was gonna be a token welcome, this guy was on fire with what is going on uh, in airway health relative to pediatrics and pediatric dentistry. Um, and Steve had me talk about things that uh, I thought were missing from the dental curriculum, one of them being anthropology. Um, anyone want to take a stab at that? Of the 200 people that were in the room, not one person raised their hand when I posed this question. Hopefully by the end of this, everyone's going to know. Um, humans like us, our genome, is over 250,000 years old. That means you could go on a time machine and go back a quarter of a million years, perhaps longer, and you would open it up in Africa because that's the only humans that were on the planet at that time were in Africa. And you could reproduce with somebody that could have a baby that could also have a baby. Who would have thought? Who knew that? I, you know, I thought 10,000 years was a long time. So anyway, this is common knowledge in Western Europe, in Northern Europe. These are kids' uh, flashcards that I found at the Museum of Man uh, in, in Paris uh, for kids four to six years old. And they were learning this. I, I count this as you know, evidence. This is absolutely published evidence, uh, even if it's in a kid's flashcard. Um, phylogeny is you know, how long uh, from your ancestry you know, a trait might appear and you know, how it might change or not. Ontogeny is just one generation, you know, from conception to death, what can happen? And the best illustration is what we see. Look at the chin on this child in a 20 week gestation ultrasound. This is him at three years old. And this is just something I brought off the internet, but this is reliably predictable. And this has been in the literature for over a hundred years. Class two skeletal malocclusion will not self-correct once detected in the deciduous dentition. And it's like, well, you know, so what? You can fix it later. Okay, what if it was eyesight? What if it was myopia? Do you want, if you're the parent of a three-year-old kid with myopia and you know it will not improve, it cannot self-correct, just like skeletal malocclusion, cannot self-correct, and you know that it could correlate with neurological problems, are you going to listen to an ophthalmologist that tells you wait till he's driving a car? Yet it happens in dentistry routinely. Save up your money for braces. That's silly. I'm going to talk about something called evolutionary oral medicine. And this is Ben just found out tonight that he and I are going to be teaching a course in evolutionary oral medicine. And this is going to be our textbook. It's a paperback. It's the first book that was written on evolutionary medicine in the 1990s by Randy Nessie, who is very interested in helping me bring this into dentistry. So I'm also gonna introduce a concept, if you've ever heard me talk, uh, and Steve has this in his textbook, he's one of the first people to publish it, the craniofacial respiratory complex. You cannot separate them. It, and I always make the analogy between the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, and I ask people, what does CDC stand for? And they'll say Center for Disease Control. And I wait. And prevention. Everyone leaves and prevention off. So I would really like it if I can make a good argument that please don't use the term craniofacial because it implies there's respiratory connection there too. They're, the face is connected to the airway. This has been known for 100 years. 1921, Dr. Leroy Johnson and he was chairman of ortho at Harvard. And he said, the face has evolved for the functions of chewing and breathing, mastication and respiration. Uh, Robert Lustig, some of you have heard of him. He's a pediatric endocrinologist at the University of San Francisco, California, San Francisco. He and I are now on the lecture circuit talking together about oxygen utilization. Uh, and, and he has got this in his textbook, Metabolical 
Um, and he, he actually cites Leroy Johnson in that book. Um, <clears throat> so what has happened to faces? I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Hopefully some of you have heard me. Hopefully you're curious. If you wanna know more, I'm gonna put my email at the end. Got loads of things for people to read. But our jaws for 250,000 years were perfect. If you didn't have a perfect jaw, a perfect craniofacial respiratory complex by age six, before about two or 300 years ago, you were dead. You did not survive childhood, okay? And there's reasons for that that I won't go into now, but this is a very supported hypothesis uh, that kids, if they didn't have a perfect wide forward and horizontally growing mandible and maxilla face connected to the airway, they did not survive childhood and live to become an adult and reproduce and become an ancestor. How in the world has this fallen out of dental education? All right. This is from a dental society in 1881. They were talking about a cause for lessened pronathism of the upper jaw being too far back, not necessarily being a class three, but the upper jaw is not growing forward. It's not growing wide enough. It's not growing forward enough. And it's growing longer. They've known this for a hundred years yet is kept out of our dental training. I think this is wrong. And I'm so glad Steve asked me to identify some things that I felt were wrong. I could be wrong, but I don't think <laughs> I don't think I am on this one. Um, so anyway, even Darwin figured this out in The Descent of Man in 1871, that the shortening of the jaws, it has to do with the soft diet. And oh my gosh, look at this last line here. In the United States, sometimes they remove molar teeth in children to make you know, their teeth fit. Go figure, extractions. So we've come up with a hypothesis and we call it a new angle. It's the maxillary class three retruded maxilla and the, the mandibular class two retronathic mandible on top of each other. We call it class four. And I've run this by several maxillofacial surgeons who can't, they don't necessarily agree with me, but they have not come up with evidence to support why we shouldn't do it. If you get criticized, oh, that's not an angle classification. Just take away the capital A on angle and use a lowercase a. It's a new angle, huh? Play on words, but it works. Um, Rob Lustig and I have done a lot of work together. Uh, and we are going to be talking in San Francisco uh, at uh, Brian Hockle and Kevin Adair's uh, study club. Little plug there. Sorry, had to do it. But I think it's open to the public, maybe virtually. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a lot of this stuff. Um, here's their study club. Um, and I got to tell you, um, this is going to be quite a meeting. It's in two weeks in San Francisco. That's where I'm staying. That's my hotel. Uh, Try Airbnb boat. This is in a harbor, uh, not too far from Walnut Creek. And i that's my bedroom over here. Just thought I'd uh, break it up a little bit and show you how crazy I am. Um, <clears throat> maxillary expansion. Who would have thought? You know, oral and general health, quality of life. These are all things. And these are kids that were, you know, this is the youngest kid. If this works on a six-year-old, on an almost eight-year-old, on a 12-year-old, and it works when there's a crossbite. Most of the inclusion criteria in these studies mean all the kids gotta have a crossbite. Um, I call that a word that starts with bull, has an S in the middle, and it's not bullseye, okay? That is total nonsense. You do not need a posterior crossbite. And if I had time, I would play you Sean Carlson, orthodontist in San Francisco, who talks about a Boston University study that says you do not need a posterior crossbite to, uh, you know, indi uh, indication for maxillary expansion in a child. He treats older kids. I say you, you treat it when you see it because it will not self-improve. Now, the ophthalmology people have known about this for years. If a child has myopia, you're not going to wait. And this is your fail safe. If you get criticism from colleagues, from parents, Arm them with this knowledge. You would never let your kids suffer from myopia. Don't let them suffer from malocclusion because of the extreme high prevalence 
of comorbidity with sleep and breathing disorders, which correlate with risk for neurological and neurobehavioral problems. So look at this study right here. Deciduous dentition malocclusion predicts orthodontic treatment needs later. So the conclusion is, oh my gosh, if you see a deciduous malocclusion, you need to tell the parents to prepare, save up their money for braces. Does that make sense? That is not a defensible position to hold. So if some of you have come here because you're curious, that's all I care about is arousing curiosity right now. And, and it doesn't mean you need to treat, but you do need to risk assess with validated risk assessment. That is the main objective of my talk today. I, if you wanna learn how to treat, you have to do techniques courses. You need to understand this uh, of how to do it. But if you're fixing crossbites in, in 10 year olds, you can do it in a two year old and a three year old and a four year old. <clears throat> this is a metric that you will teach to the, to the ENTs. Most ENTs don't know about this. When you widen transverse the maxilla in any kid, and I've got cone beams that I'm not gonna show you here, but you not only widen the nasal cavity, you increase the sagittal depth of the bony nasal pharynx. Big word, I can explain it later if you, you know, email me to show you, but the distance between the, and the most anterior portion of foramen magnum in the posterior nasal spine, when you widen the kid's jaw sag, uh, transversely, you sagittally make the airway come forward. And Audrey Yoon in her paper, actually she didn't mention this aspect of it. What they found out is when they expanded eight-year-olds, and again, if it works in an eight-year-old with crossbites, it'll work in a four-year-old without a crossbite. What they found was the adenoid tissue normalized. It, it did, and, and they did it. It was significant change. What they didn't mention in the paper, but they showed, look at this maxilla. It came forward. That anterior crossbite is gone, okay? How come? Did the teeth come out? Maybe a little bit, but the entire maxillary complex, this distance from here to here changed. So what do you think about this? Children who have not only a better quality of life, uh, if they sleep better, and then again, we haven't made the direct connection between maxillary expansion and improved self-control, but the Dunedin study, please Google it, D capital D-U-N-E-D-I-N, uh, 1,037 children born in New Zealand, same hospital in 1973, were followed originally for 10 years, it's now in its 50th year and there's still over a thousand adults in the study. And one of the things they found was children who have better self-control before the age of 11, they will look younger, 10 years younger. I'm not gonna show it, but the, the images are incredible. They manage wealth better. They manage anxiety better. They do you know, better educationally. They, and they have less susceptibility to chronic disease. They will live longer health span, lifespan, and they will have longer health spans, optimized health spans, if they have better self-control. What is one of the main metrics that you see in kids after you expand them when they, when they come to you with child malocclusion and comorbidity with sleep disorder breathing? It is such a highly, uh, almost every patient that comes in, and well, things have got worse. Well, I'm an optimist. That's good. But so many parents report, usually within four to six months, their kids sleeping better. They're not wet in their bed, whatever. You don't promise that to anybody. The malocclusion will not self-correct. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to under-promise and over-deliver. I am a dentist. I'm going to fix the malocclusion. But I'm going to do it in such a way that will be conducive to giving adequate tongue space with myofunctional therapy and releases of tongue ties and lip ties. Um, and, and I follow Larry Kotlow's uh, grading system. Uh, Milt Gavilis it was uh, Saru Sagi's first resident, uh, former head of periodontics at Northwestern Dental School. He does it, and he will not expand. He will not do a release on a child until there's myofunctional therapy, until I built a house for that tongue to live in. But look at that. This is incredible what you can do. Up here, you can see. This is the lower adenoid, the upper adenoid. 
all these things change. The yellow is after T0, T2, T1 was uh, what they did. So that's a beautiful paper by uh, Rebecca Bacow and, and Audrey Yoon and Kushida and others. So here we are, health span. That is, you know, how our lifespan is how long you're gonna live from birth. We wanna increase the lifespan, but not leave the health span back at 63. I mean, this guy right here, okay, you're gonna have 16 years of crappy life, but okay, you live longer. No, we want you to live longer and we want you to stay healthier longer. So you're gonna only have five crummy years. Uh, you know, so and then they way should to look have, at it. I say, does not mean that you must do the same. The past need not dictate the future. Your longevity is more malleable than you think. In 1900, life expectancy hovered somewhere south of age 50, and most people were likely to die from fast causes, accidents, injuries, and infectious diseases of various kinds. Since then, slow death has supplanted fast death. The majority of people listening to this book can expect to die somewhere in their 70s or 80s, give or take, and almost all from slow causes. Assuming you're not someone who engages in ultra risky behavior like base jumping, motorcycle racing, or texting and driving, the odds are overwhelming that you will die as a result of one of the chronic diseases of aging that I call the four horsemen. Four horsemen, cancer, type two diabetes, neurodegenerative disorders, and cardiorespiratory problems. Cardiorespiratory fitness is a new metric that I never knew anything about. And guess what impacts it? Healthy eating, healthy weight, healthy activity, and what else? Healthy sleeping and breathing. So we have, Steve Carsonson has done so much to get into the lexicon of dentistry that we get away from dental health. Dental health is a component of oral health. But what else is a component of oral health? Optimizing what? Airway. It is our responsibility, a, a collaborative responsibility. It's a shared domain. Anything above the clavicles is a shared domain with the other healthcare professionals. That's my own hypothesis. Um, please blow a hole in it. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I am. So this is something that really comes to play when the American Heart Association talks about cardiorespiratory fitness as a metric. This is something that we should be paying attention to because the way a child sleeps and breathes is absolutely something that plays into, and it's terrible. American kids have very poor, now this was in July of 2020. I don't know what the new uh, data says, but it's not good. And this, I, you know, I came into healthcare as a, you know, I have a master's degree in nutrition and dietetics. And I just thought dentists need to be doing more about diet counseling. Well, guess what diet counseling pays when you do it and you know, in dental practice, even though there's an ADA insurance code for it, nothing, a big goose egg. But who cares? When I do this, I have gotten so much positive feedback from parents that, you know, please tell them, you know, that I want to be healthy. Don't tell them I do, you tell them, they listen to you. This is, this is the way, the only way I thought I could help systemic health in children. And I was on a crusade. That's how I met Rob Lustig. But this is a new way to impact overall wellness in children. Not only healthy eating, but healthy sleeping and breathing. So the fourth dimension, you know, we have transverse, sagittal, and vertical. This is the fourth dimension of pediatric dentistry. Okay, I got nine minutes left, so I'm going to go fast. Um, it is behavior guidance. Okay, now this is there's classes in it. We need to have more classes in it. Uh, Airway Health Solutions. I have proposed that we have a whole module in it. I've introduced it in in my own mini residency. Uh, but I want to involve some, you know, dental assisting, dental assistants. They're the ones that help behavior guides more than anybody. I'm so glad there's dental assistants here. Uh, Lauren, I want, to, I want to introduce a dental assisting course, if there isn't one already at AHS, um, that will really help because they're the ones who get it done. I sometimes I just go upstairs and I come down and the comb beam's taken on a, you know, three-year-old who was had to be peeled off the ceiling. 
Um, <clears throat> they have accreditation standards for all specialties in undergraduate dentistry. Pediatric dentistry is the only one that has content on behavior guidance, clinical training opportunities, didactic content in child development, nothing for orthodontists, which implies why would we need that? We don't treat them that young. They don't need to be treated that young. In fact, they shouldn't be treated that young. I mean, that's how far it can go. So this is something that I want everyone here because the vast majority of people on this call are what Steve and I call primary care dentists. Please don't call yourself a general dentist ever again if you're taking care of kids. Uh, I just, in, I, I feel very strongly. Pediatric dentists are primary care dentists for kids, uh, but they're also specialists. Um, and you guys with DDSs, DMDs, you are primary care dentists and you are the army. You are the workforce. This is the only way it's going to get done. Um, a study that was published in the Academy Journal pretty much said pediatric denti or general dentists are not, you know, primary care dentists are not prepared adequately to deal with kids. In fact, they might even harm kids. Now, that doesn't mean harm them physically in the chair. That means by not seeing them, by not being comfortable. And these people will go without care, even into adulthood. So these, these are the kids I showed you at the beginning that I want to show you how I dealt with them. These are two children. Uh, well, no, this is the first one. This is one of the, the two children. There's no question that that child's mandible is back. And this is at two and a half years old. She was, the parents were told nothing can be done. They had her genetic tested for Pierre Robin. She didn't have it. Uh, but they just said, you know, jaw surgery, uh, keep her teeth clean, no cavities. Uh, if she has a crossbite, we'll fix it, but, you know, nothing to do. Guess what? This happened in less than four years, okay? I expanded her, and guess what else I did? I put her in a reverse pole face mask as if she was class three. I made it more severe, and look how that mandible came forward with myofunctional therapy, and uh, she did not need her tonsils or adenoids out, and it changed her life. This is so important. Anybody can do this. These are the bolt and brush norms. You can place these templates. This is the only longitudinal normative uh, database in it all in healthcare that shows where a child's face should be. This is incredible what happened with this child. You should see her now. Uh, I, next time I'll, I'll give you another picture. Here's a maxillary insufficiency. Here she was um, less than two years later. Here she is at nine no surgery. And she had, she was referred by sleep medicine. She had pretty, you know, pretty severe sleep disorder breathing. She did not have uh, severe apnea. She had apnea, but, and the parents were told nothing to do, going to need jaw surgery. Look at this sleep. This is the pediatric sleep questionnaire from Sherman. All these yeses, all these problems were resolved or resolving. This, to me, is more important than what you saw physically there. Oh, that's nice. The parents are thrilled. But that is what thrills me. So malocclusion is a disease. Don't kid yourself. Oh, it's a developmental situation. I've heard and read things in, in orthodontic textbooks and, and whatnot. It's a disease. This is Audrey Yoon's paper. This is a great paper. This is where I live under the age of six, under 72 months old. Um, and Lauren, thank you for you know, sending this out to all, all of us on the faculty here. Um, again, Pitya, you know, he's the guy who pretty much in this, this critique of Audrey's paper, uh, Audrey's paper, they brought up Peter Atia. I was stunned when I hadn't read this commentary, Lauren, until you sent it to me. And pretty much, you know, how should we screen and diagnose? Uh, Jerry Simmons uh, heads uh, the, the screener task force at the ADA uh, 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 task force that Steve set up uh, with, with the, uh, um, you know, American Dental Association. That was pretty much everyone uh, that, that was on the faculty. The course last weekend was involved with. Um, this is a screener that we're, we're trying to get funding for to do a validation study. Uh, if anybody might be interested in this, and I think Steve might talk about it. Um, this is, we need more beta testers for it. Um, this is where I live. Who's heard of high chair dentistry? Huh? Her name is 
uh, Winifred Booker. She's in Massachusetts. You can get this course. I encourage anyone, please, to join the Academy of Pediatric Dentistry. Unlike the Academy of Orthodontics, we encourage non-pediatric dentists to join us, to become associate members. And this newly erupted Joel Berg, uh, who I spent an hour, a half hour with yesterday and who was at the course, um, is, is doing a lot to help uh, bring this to the public and not just to pediatric dentists, but uh, uh, primary care dentists like yourselves. This thing has got to go away. This is medically indefensible. Um, no later than age seven. Seven is a geriatric patient to me. Uh, and I'm not trying to be funny. I am totally serious. I'd love to see all these kids before seven. But most treatment, they say, doesn't really happen between until nine or 11 years old. And they're proud of that. This is still in their brochure. So whatever. So the conclusions are that, you know, people, undergraduate dentists need to be better trained in dental school. Steve is not optimistic. It's, a, it's like a big ship trying to get it to move. But I think there's power in numbers. Um, if anybody thinks this is making any sense, um, you know, please let me know. My email will be at the end of this. I'm almost done, thank God, because I got two minutes. Um, this is a paper um, that is a uh, meta-analysis, most powerful form of research is looking at uh, you know, studies of various uh, robust, uh, robustity, I don't know if that's a word, but I got, it, it was almost a 5,000 papers, whittled down to almost 4,000, down to 125, and then down to nine. I downloaded all nine of these papers. I will share them with anybody. One of the problems I had with it is that they didn't spend enough time on transverse deficiency. Ben Morales says, the maxilla is the criminal. The mandible is the victim. Class two will never self-correct. You got a distal step molar at three, guess what? You tell those parents that we got to do something now. Don't say save up your money for braces. These are two of the papers that did pay attention to the transverse dimension. Uh, and these are the types of things. And again, I'd like to share all these papers. And if anybody wants to help me with doing annotated bibliographies on them to share with other people and submit to AHS and then to the world, um, please help me. So anyway, Saving up your money for braces is an indefensible position. Remember this, when you have to defend yourselves, just use the analogy, it's a good one. Two-year-olds are seen for getting their eyes tested for myopia and other what we call refractive errors. This is the last slide. It's one standard for everybody, Wes. You don't see any options, no middle ground. No, I don't see playing politics to the truth, really. No way to compromise. Oh, on strategy, maybe but not on principle. Never forget that, you guys. There's lots of ways here. Myo, releases, fixed, removable, but you cannot compromise on principle. Strategy, yes, but not principle. There you have it. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. That was a great way to kick it off. We had so many nice comments. Uh, we did post the articles, the links that everyone can access as PDFs uh, in the chat. So, um, wow, great way to kick it off. I can't wait for our panel discussion for everyone to chime in on your presentation. But our next speaker is Dr. Brett Christensen. Um, Dr. Brett uh, Christensen attended Creighton University School of Dentistry in Omaha, Nebraska, with a Doctor of Dental Surgery in 1993. Christensen completed his orthodontic residency at the University of Louisville, Kentucky, where he not only received his specialty certificate in orthodontics, but also received a master's degree in oral biology. In, 19, uh, in 2019, he received diplomat status uh, with the ASBA, the American Sleep and Breathing Academy. Christensen has been treating sleep disorder breathing since becoming an orthodontist in 1999. So thank you, Dr. Christensen, for being here and sharing your expertise. Can't can't wait to hear your presentation. All righty. Can you hear me now? Is it yeah. working? All right, and you can see the presentation. Good. Well, um, this is exciting to have this many people on here. Um, I... Uh, I, I want to share my um, my experience of of uh, how I became an airway den an airway orthodontist because I think um, everybody's got to go through their um, their why 
And um, when I uh, became a dentist or an orthodontist, um, I was taught extractions, I was taught headgear, and I, I practiced that for a while. And what I did is uh, I would treat patients that had crossbites with an expander. And then when the expander um, patients came in, I had parents that would come to me and say, wow, ever since you expanded my kid, my kid's doing better in school. They uh, stop bedwetting. Um, they're not snoring. Uh, they're sleeping through the night. And initially I blew that off. And after a while, um, I, with more and more parents that were telling me this, I uh, said, well, what is, what's, what's the, uh, what's happening here? And the one thing that I noticed um, is that when I did expansion, I didn't ever had to take, take out teeth on these kids. And then I decided, you know what, I'm going to just see if I can do more expansion and not just on crossbites. And by doing so, um, I created more space. And then the stories and the parents, they just overflowed my practice where they would come in and say, wow, ever since we did the expansion, my kid's sleeping better and, and breathing better. And, and uh, <clears throat> you know, they stopped bedwetting. And, and, uh, and so probably about 12 years ago, I decided I'm no longer going to be an extraction orthodontist. And I'm just going to... Um, just going to do expansion. And uh, um, fast forward to, um, oh, I think it was about 2018. Um, my daughter, uh, <clears throat> she called me um, and uh, she knew I'd been treating, um, you know, kids and that. And uh, we had been taking some airway courses. And she said, Dad, um, <clears throat> Everly is, uh, she stops breathing at nighttime. And uh, I apologize. <clears throat> Seems like every time I tell this story, I, I get emotional. And I shouldn't because I've told this story many, many times. But uh, um, she's, you know, she asked me what I could do. And so we brought her in and we took a, a CT scan uh, on her. And she was three years old. And uh, the T CT scan showed... Um, uh, class four tonsils and um, adenoids that were just obstructing her airway. And I wanted to refer her um, to the ENT, but my daughter refused to, to do that. And, um, and she says, you've got to be able to do something. And so <clears throat> at, you know, barely three years old, we made our first, uh, you know, uh, very young pediatric uh, expander. And uh, within a month um, of doing expansion, she was no longer a mouth breather. And within three months, we took a new CT scan and her tonsils and adenoids had shrunk. And uh, she became a different person. She was no longer wetting the bed. She wasn't having uh, um, all the issues that go along with that. And at that point in time, I, I decided that uh, I needed to step out of the way of the, <clears throat> the training that I'd had as an orthodontist, and I need to um, focus um, more directly on, on uh, little kids and, and everybody's airway. And so uh, uh, ever since about 2018, 2019, my practice has been um, 100% um, airway orthodontics and, and treating um, airways. And so we start treating kids um, at birth. Um, when we look at uh, how the craniofacial um, complex develops, and the way that I understand things now is that a baby starts to um, swallow at about 20 weeks in embryo. And every time they swallow, um, their tongue's supposed to push into the roof of their mouth and help their jaws to grow. And if that tongue doesn't function correctly, whether it's tied or it's just got a, um, some other functional problem, then um, a lot of these babies will be born with underdeveloped uh, maxillas and underdeveloped nasal airways. Um, and uh, you can see on this um, chart here, I'm not going to go through it. Everybody's seen all these different things what the underdeveloped jaws <clears throat> and mouth uh, lead to. And it's not just about um, teeth. And I, 
I tell patients and parents all the time, you know, they come in for teeth. And uh, I said, you're really not here for their teeth. I said, um, you're here because of uh, airway issues and breathing issues, but I have to use the teeth to get us um, to a point where your kid is gonna be healthy. And so um, I wanted to show you a few cases that, uh, that I've done. And uh, this is uh, one of the little gals that came to me, her mother came and, uh, she said, uh, you know, she's six years old. She stops breathing. Um, she uh, is a mouth breather, 100%. Um, and she has headaches. And, and headaches on a, on a six-year-old is not normal. I don't think headaches anytime is normal. Um, and she had frequent throat and ear infections. Uh, when we looked um, at her initial panorex, um, even if you don't know anything about the dental arches, this is a very underdeveloped maxilla. Um, we don't have room for the central and lateral incisors to um, develop the canines. Uh, Dr. Boyd, he talks about the uh, um, Panorex uh, analysis. And um, so she was very, very crowded. Um, and so <clears throat> when one of the things that I use every single day, and I have three of these machines in my office, and I wish I had four or five, because I test every single patient that walks through the door with uh, what's called the rhinometer. Now, this is the old screen back when it was the green screen. Um, but when um, this patient came in, uh, her minimum cross-sectional area was uh, 1.1 millimeters and 1.4 millimeters as a six-year-old. Her volume was 1.7 cubic centimeters and two cubic centimeters. A cubic centimeter is the size of a dice. So, so basically she only had, you know, if you take a, uh, if you had a dice that was made out of Play-Doh and you squish it around and you make it an airway, that's all she could breathe through. Um, and so she was very underdeveloped. When we look at <clears throat> um, where these patients should be. As a six-year-old, she should be, um, minimum cross-sectional area should be around um, five millimeters. Um, and she was at one millimeter, so extremely underdeveloped. And her volume um, should have been around almost six cubic centimeters, and she was back here at two. And so there's no wonder why she was a mouth breather and struggling and mouth breathing uh, leads to tonsils and adenoids being big. And, uh, and so um, when we look at her and we call it a phase 1A, I stole that from Kevin Boyd. And, uh, but as a phase 1A, we're not really going in and trying to do a whole lot with the teeth, but at two weeks, she already had a gap. And at four weeks, she had a really big gap. Um, and the uh, exciting part of that is within four weeks, she stopped snoring and she slept through the night. Um, and so she became a nasal breather. <clears throat> and so um, this is her uh, Panorex down the road, just with one expander. Um, we had gained a tremendous amount of space for her teeth, but if you notice, she's still underdeveloped even with that first expander. And so uh, I have um, hundreds of patients that, uh, um, that have had more than one expander, some of them even three. And uh, the uh, criteria is, can you breathe? And if you, if you can't breathe through your nasal passage, um, and uh, after one expander, if it's if it's not working, we start looking at multiple things, not just the the dental arches and the teeth. If we have enough room for the teeth, then we start looking at patients and saying, okay, is this allergies? Uh, what is the reason why they still um, their turbinates and that are big? But um, on this little patient right here, two years later, um, she uh, has had a, a second expander. But here's her um, rhinometer readings um, after the first expansion. So she went from basically one millimeter minimum cross-sectional area to almost four and five millimeters. And she went from two cubic centimeters 
to four and and uh, six cubic centimeters. Um, so a, a two to um, six cubic centimeter, um, that's a 200% improvement in, in the nasal volume. Um, and that's just with one expander. Um, and so um, I have a uh, dentist that, uh, um, if I could take a little bit of a detour off of things, um, last, uh, last year I got hit by a car and um, when I was out biking, and I had uh, um, uh, some pretty big health uh, problems. I thought that it was mainly just a shoulder injury, but um, I uh, ended up having um, going in to get a shoulder surgery done, and they found out that I had uh, had my aortic valve torn in uh, when this car had hit me when I was biking. And uh, right after that, I had a gal that came and and uh, she's a dentist, Dr. Radabaugh. And um, uh, I had been treating her daughter um, for the last few years. And so this is her daughter, but Dr. Radabaugh actually came and took care of my practice for uh, the last few months because I had open heart surgery. Um, and uh, so her daughter is amazing to, for us to be able to share this with because um, she got some things done on her early before she really knew anything about what I was doing. And so as a baby, um, she had a very shallow latch, clicking, gagging, gassing, hiccups, um, lip didn't flange up where it's supposed to be, um, very difficulty, a lot of difficulty in her nursing. Um, and uh, so she took her, I think, down to Boise and somebody did a, a electrocautery uh, a tongue and lip tie procedure. They did not tell her how to do any of the stretches, any of the myofunctional therapy that needs to be done on babies to make sure it heals correctly. And so things reattached. Um, <clears throat> she did uh, nurse for 16 months, um, but because the tongue reattached and didn't function well, she still had some growth and development problems. She still had sleep issues. And so it's not just a matter of, hey, I went and had my tongue clipped, now everything's fine. Um, if we can get these babe, you know, babies initially taken care of and get the myofunctional therapy, get the stretches done so they function right, that's how they uh, grow correctly. Um, anyway, they finally brought her in to see me and uh, she was having all of these different issues. And um, uh, we decided to go ahead and treat her at an early age. And I think we treated her around uh, three or four years old. And so these are all of her symptoms that she had. Um, and that's Dr. Radaba there in the middle. She's actually finishing taking care of my patients for the next five minutes. Um, if she gets a chance, I'll have her stop in here and say hi to everybody. Um, and so uh, <clears throat> she, this, is, uh, this is little Miss Hadley right in here. And uh, we started her and notice she's a class two. Uh, deep bite, no spaces for her primary teeth. And these are some of the pictures of the staff taking impressions on her when she's um, back in 2020. I think she was four years old at that time. It's hard to see the uh, ex Everly expander in there, but just a small expander that fits on two uh, primary molars. And uh, after four weeks of doing expansion, she was now nasal breathing, um, improved sleep, her speech improved, um, tonsils reduced in size. Um, here we go. This is her little expander that we did. And you can see very sim simplistic uh, design on there. Today, what I do is I usually incorporate two teeth on each side instead of one. We had a lot of the little kids that would um, reach in there with their fingers and can get it loose. So um, uh, you, can, you can even see on there how uh, um, the lip tie has a, an effect on things. Um, so another part of here is that uh, didn't realize that her speech would improve, but she couldn't say her R's and stuff before um, we did the uh, expansion on her. And then after that, she could say her, um, she could say her R's better. Um, and she's got a video here. I was gonna try and see if I can get it. Um, 
Uh, let's see here. Here's here's the videos of I'm trying to get this thing the bottom. There we go. All right. This is her sleeping before the expansion. Okay, there's one video. Here's the other one. Mouth open mouth posture. And then here's uh oops, there we go. Here's a video a few weeks into it. Notice the mouth is closed. And you can't hear her. Here's another one. Uh, it's dark. But again, mouth is closed and she's breathing through her nose. Um, even right there when she moved, you can tell that she still was being a nasal breather. Um, all right, fast forward <clears throat> with Hadley um, here about three more years. And now she's seven and a half and she's ready for her second expander. Um, uh, notice that she's still uh, on the x-rays and stuff like that, dentally constriction, constricted. And so uh, this is her pretreatment. Um, and then we uh, did an expander on the upper jaw and the lower jaw. And uh, these are with those guys in. Um, she likes to show off. She's sticking things in between her teeth with her gaps. Um, just 10 days of turning, and we're getting a lot of space for those teeth, but also improving her airway. There she is fully expanded on the top and about halfway expanded on the lower um, at four weeks into it, and then progression of everything. So this is Hadley's tongue. Um, when we look at that, she had a tongue tie release as an infant. And so uh, she's uh, going to be doing her myofunctional therapy. And then we'll be doing what's called a functional frenuloplasty. It's not a phrenectomy. It's a much better release, and we're getting much better results by doing um, a functional frenuloplasty. This little guy right here, his mother worked for a sleep medicine doctor, and uh, she came in because she had heard that uh, we treated kids with uh, sleep apnea, and uh, <clears throat> so snoring, mouth breathing, not refreshed in the morning, speech issues. This is a, our CT scan of his airways. And so in our computer um, on the oral airway, blue is good and anything uh, that goes green, yellow, orange, red is bad. And you can tell that the adenoids were very enlarged and nasal passage was very um, compromised. And so um, even on his Panorex, you can tell that this is an underdeveloped um, uh, maxilla and mandible, not enough room for all of those teeth. Um, he had a severe tongue tie um transverse was bad and so and then here is his uh, rhinometer readings uh beforehand um and then i'm going to just play the this is an audio we asked his mother to um play or record what her experience was in in treating her son so i'm just going to just play this here my name is Kathleen. My son Jubal is six. We are relatively new patients of Dr. Christensen and have been very thankful for our, our experience with him. When our son was two, he was normally very happy in the morning, very outgoing, singing like a lark, literally. And over time that went away and we hadn't even noticed it until we started seeing Dr. Christensen. Our son was having severe sleep apnea at night he was uh, groggy in the morning, taking at least an hour to wake up and be his normal, happy, cheerful self. He did not even want to talk about breakfast first thing in the morning because he couldn't even think about what he wanted, asked me not to ask him, that kind of thing. Very shortly before he got his expander, I found him one night having sleep apnea almost every other breath for a significant period of time. Six days after starting the expander, I went in one night and stood there wondering to myself, how long has it been since I could just listen to my son breathe peacefully in his sleep? How long has it been since he sounded like this? Another six or so days after that, still continuing to turn the expander, I went in there one night and he was flat on his back again, which is normally big sleep apnea for him. And there was no sound of struggle breathing. There was a slight rasp every now and then. 
but the sound of him breathing on his back 12 days after starting the expander was better than he had sounded in a long time without it. So we are on our way with getting better breathing at night, and we are very thankful for what Dr. Christensen does. <clears throat> that is my why, why I do what I do. I wake up in the morning and I am so, so grateful to be able to breathe. Look at Jubal, um, and we look at his uh, development of his teeth. Um, he's uh, definitely got more room for his teeth to come in, but he, the most important part is that he's breathing better. And as I look at even on the Panrex, um, he will be headed for a second expander here probably in the next year or so uh, to gain even more room for his teeth um, and to help him with his airways even more. Um, and then his airways improved about two millimeters on the minimum cross-sectional area and about one, one to two cubic centimeters on volume. Um, uh, here's another one of our patients that even at eight years old, this is our geriatric patient, according to Dr. Uh, Boyd. Um, but uh, multiple ear infections as a toddler, irritable during the day, all the different um, things that you normally see. And I wouldn't say on this panorex that he's super constricted. It looks like, you know, if you don't care about the alignment of teeth, um, his, uh, his bite would be fine. But <clears throat> when you look at his airways, um, his right nasal passage was down there at about two millimeters. Um, and as an eight-year-old, that should be up there, you know, around five millimeters instead of two. And so um, we did, he was actually a class three. So we did an expander and reverse pull headache, a reverse pull headgear. And we advanced that maxilla. And uh, now again, he's back to breathing normal. Headaches are gone. Uh, nasal breathing, plenty of room for his teeth. We didn't wait for his teeth to show up like I was taught um, in orthodontic school. We treated his airways first. And this is the cool part. Look at the lines on where he's at. He went from, what was it, a, almost a two millimeter minimum cross-sectional area up to almost a five. And his um, cubic centimeter uh, volume improved a tremendous amount. The thing that I've noticed on um, patients, not everyone, but I'm, I mean, majority of them, when you have a really bad nasal airway and you do expansion, and then you, you go in and you measure this with each patient, the, the area that was the worst usually becomes better than the other side. A lot of times you won't get a big improvement on a nasal airway um, on the side that is the better side, but the side that is really bad will, uh, a lot of times it will so, it'll correct so much that it, uh, um, it bypasses the, the side that was good before. And so, um, you know, we uh, look at uh, patients um, that come in at 17 years old. I have I have had patients, I had one this week that said, oh, you know, my daughter is 16 or 17 years old. She's too late for all this stuff you're doing with airways. And uh, um, this is a 17 year old patient that we did expansion on, snoring, mouth breather, grinding her teeth, um, you know, headaches, headaches seem to be a common thing with a lot of our patients um, when they're not getting the good airway. Um, this is her, you can see how narrow and constricted she is. Um, and uh, there's her uh, before Panorex, here's her airways when they are, you know, we started at 17 years old, she's down at three millimeter uh, minimum cross-sectional areas. And here she is, now, no longer a uh, mouth breather, but a nasal breather. Headaches are gone. Um, and then we look at that nice big broad arch and you're saying, well, you're not supposed to be able to do an expander on 17 year olds because they're done growing, right? Well, wrong. Um, you still can do expansion on them and you can improve their airways at that age. Um, and look at the improvement of her nasal airway. You know, she's down at three millimeter minimum cross-sectional area. Now she's up almost to six, which is normal. And uh, that left nasal airway is clear up of, at nine cubic centimeters. Um, so having a way to um, follow these patients and having a metric of where you should be and what you should do, I think is extremely important for all of us that uh, are treating these patients 
Um, that way we're not just relying on parents saying, oh yeah, they're doing better. Well, how, how much better are they? Um, you know, you listen to the mom about the little boy that gave us a testimonial. He was doing good at two years old. And yet he, as the older he got, the worse he got. And the reason for that is his nasal passage didn't improve even though his body grew. And so his, his oxygen requirement became more and more um, uh, the uh, older he got, but yet his airways did not improve. And so if your oxygen requirement is, is more, then your airways become more and more compromised. Um, and so uh, we'll be doing a, um, uh, a mini residency. We've been working on this for quite a few, uh, uh, well, for about a year, putting things together on the techniques of what we do, step-by-step um, -step techniques on um, doing upper and lower expansion, how we uh, use mandibular growth modification to get the mandible to grow, um, all about all the different things we do, how to, how to measure um, things with uh, the rhinometer, treatment planning, and everything like that. And so I have a... Uh, um, uh, that, that's done, I think, September 29th. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here and then we'll get back to, um, uh, there we go. And there so, we go. All right. So. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, we love hearing from airway orthodontists and you're very inspiring and hopefully um, inspiring to our other orthodontists who are on board, but also it's just so validating with the research you have with the renometry. And we really appreciate all that you do and share your experience of going full circle from what you've learned to realize, you know, what makes you tick in the morning and what your why has become. And we're so grateful for all the children and people that you've helped throughout your career. Um, yes, your mini residency is September 29th and we're thrilled to have you on our faculty. So um, again, we'll discuss more about your presentation in the panel discussion. And our third speaker is Dr. Ben Moralia. Uh, Dr. Ben Moralia is an experienced healthcare professional with a focus on dental medicine and orthodontics. He graduated from the SUNY at Buffalo School of Dental Medicine and has been practicing for 29 years in Mount Kisco with 20 years of interceptive orthodontic experience. Dr. Moralia specializes in early childhood growth and development. Dr. Moralia is a renowned lecturer, sharing his expertise nationally on topics such as sleep disorder breathing, clear aligned therapy and craniofacial and respiratory development. He is actively involved in the field and serves on the board of directors on the American Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry. And additionally, he is a member of the President's Council of Northern Westchester Hospital in Mount Kisco, New York. We're also thrilled to have him as our chief clinical consultant at Airway Health Solutions. So thank you, Ben. Uh, let's take it away and kick off with some amazing cases. All right. All right. I will try to follow those two rock stars. Oh my goodness. That was so incredible. So I've, I've heard them numerous times and every time it's better than the last. Unbelievable. And let me see what I can do to add to that. So I get some of these geriatric patients in my practice at age 13. And I know uh, this child would have been better served being treated at three or four. And of course, we are in the dental community, but we do take medical and dental histories. And so when you take a medical and dental history and you ask questions, you learn that the child who presents with symptoms, if they're 13, they might not have the symptoms from last week or last year. A lot of these kids, when you ask the parents about the history, you learn the symptoms began at three to four. And if you can identify that there are symptoms in the three to four category, then you know that child is struggling, the parents are struggling, and then you make your malocclusion diagnosis. So I'll be treating malocclusion, but we do share some of the symptoms that these children are struggling with because it is part of the medical and dental history that we're taking. So if we meet a 13 year old Evan who's struggling, but he has, he comes in with some existing hardware because he's in treatment somewhere else. He has started recently, but the parent came to us for a second opinion because they just weren't sure and they wanted more information. So they showed up for a second opinion and this is what's in there. And, you know, we'll get you some more pictures from the side, but these things are, are um, they have a history of being called distalizers, but their, their focus is on the sagittal dimension and sagittal is nose to back of head. Sagittal is, you know, the profile direction. So in the sagittal correction, it doesn't have any effect on the width. And so when we look at something like this, we see an appliance that can offer distalization. There would be elastics put on here to kind of pull the top, make some room, line up the teeth. But meanwhile, 
We focus on the transverse dimension because it's really the width that you start looking at. And according to, you know, backing up through the research, Dr. James McNamara's research on growth and development, the transverse component was the single most important diagnostic tool to predict good growth and development and then excellent jaw and teeth positioning. You back it all the way up to, and this was introduced to me by Dr. Kevin Boyd, it's Dr. Bogue's research on the transverse development and that a four-year-old should be at 30 millimeters minimum if we're going to develop into full-grown jaws with all of the teeth present. And 30 at four is a good starting point. But then when you track it to McNamara, you really should be 35 at eight and 40 by 12 and 45 by 18. And now you're talking about a human being who could actually have 32 teeth. Uh, so this little guy comes in at 13 years old and he's 35 millimeters. So 35 millimeters between three and 14 is deficient when you are um, 35 millimeters and 13 years old. You are shy on space for teeth, so we can see crowding. But if your maxilla and your mandible are underdeveloped, you also have, like everybody else has been saying along the way, a compromised airway. So airway is a space, but that space is formed and dictated by the growth of the jaws, or have they grown wider and forward? Well, it turns out if we're treating in a sagittal direction, we're going to maintain that 35 because it would be making room for the teeth front to back. So distalization can line up front teeth. But this child has an interesting behavioral component because he's has a diagnosis of what's called ODD. That's oppositional defiance disorder. And if you haven't come across it yet, just keep asking more questions of your pediatric patients and you'll start to learn that ODD is out there, oppositional defiant disorder. It turns out if you can uh, define it, give it some letters, put some symptoms together, you can medicate it. And so that's where this is heading in that direction. But meanwhile, when we measure 35 and we know he's too narrow, we're going to expand him. So just as Dr. Christensen was saying, upper and lower fixed expanders at age 13. So at 13, we put him into the upper expander and we take him out to here. Now, if you don't know or haven't seen me speak before, I referenced the cotton roll a lot. A bowling gauge is very nice, but our cotton rolls measure 37. So when that cotton roll is 37, you're looking at 43. So we give him eight millimeters of maxillary expansion and we follow it with the lower. He goes through two expanders. Now he came in wearing his lower lingual control arch because of course that had to go with the upper sagittal appliance for his sagittal correction. Once we sat the parent down and talked about the difference between going front to back versus side to side, they agreed to switch. So we brought them in and we started treating him and we gave him with. Ignore the sagittal, treat the transverse. And that's how we heal the child because now at 43, we've affected the nasal chamber as well as release the mandible. Now his tongue has room. At 35 millimeters, the tongue has no room. So on the left side of the screen, that lower control arch is gonna be there for stability doing a sagittal technique, but his tongue will never have more room. So when we open him up by eight millimeters, now the tongue has more room. So not only is he wider, he's also forward. Dr. Boyd pointed out, transverse or lateral expansion delivers forward movement and growth. All of that comes out of the University of Michigan. There's some very nice research there for you. But what it does deliver is a child that now has a fully developed maxilla, a fully developed mandible, foundation first, teeth second, deliver all of the teeth where they belong. But now you have nasal cavity and tongue space. So while we treated his underdeveloped jaws, we took a foundation first, tooth second approach rather than just a tooth approach. We redirect that child, transverse expansion by eight millimeters, upper and lower fixed expanders, then tooth alignment with some brackets and wires. In the end, we have full maxillary development. Now what happens is the transition to nasal breathing. So now the nasal breather sleeps through the night and wakes up in the morning refreshed. And that's because of the difference between nasal and mouth breathing. If you learn that a child is doing mouth breathing or worse, then the sleep gets interrupted. Mouth breathing leads to sleep fragmentation. You don't need to have OSA to have sleep fragmentation. You don't need to have OSA to ruin a proper sleep cycle. The only thing you really need to ruin a proper sleep cycle to sleep fragment a child is actually nasal airflow resistance. So the sleep cycles get ruined at the beginning of this cascade at nasal airflow resistance. Mouth breathing would be worse and obstructive sleep apnea is the worst you could be. So never mind getting to OSA. If you have any sign of mouth breathing, snoring, et cetera, you have a child that will have sleep fragmentation or sleep cycles that are broken. Meanwhile, when you develop the maxilla and the mandible fully, what you get is a child that no longer has the symptoms that make an ODD diagnosis, oppositional device disorder. Now you've got a child who has excellent behavior, is happy, well-adjusted, wakes up, goes to school, behaves himself all day long, comes home and is happy. And then when he comes in for the retainer checks, we say, how's it going? Are you wearing your retainer every night? Sure. And it's just a clear retainer to keep his teeth lined up perfectly. But now you have a child who's happy and healthy. And again, we only treat the 
malocclusion, the underdeveloped jaws, foundation first, teeth second. Symptoms that are recorded early tend to improve, and that's been the experience I've had over the last 20 years. Another one, Nicole, age 14, even older, an advanced geriatric patient at 14 years old, coming in for a second opinion. So now this patient has three lower incisors by genetics. There's only three there. It wasn't, wasn't taken out. It wasn't extracted. But you can see here that she has a history. She's in for a second opinion because the parents didn't feel comfortable with what was going on. So of course, she comes in like many children who have had an upper expander only, and she's had an upper expander only. And here she is with a little bit of a negative over jet, and her canines are coming fast and furious at the laterals. So having had her upper expander and braces, she's at the point where the parents were told, well, we have done everything we possibly can, but now it's time to start extracting the teeth. So that's when they paused and said, maybe we have to get another opinion. So of course, at this point, she's here and she has four brackets on the front teeth. There is no room for the canines, which you saw a moment ago were there. And now they're told, well, we have to take out teeth. So, you know, then the next step is going to be which teeth? Well, in this case, it happens to be the upper laterals because the canines are right there. So let's take out the upper laterals is what she's being recommended to do. But taking out the upper laterals, boy, that's going to be a deficiency in the upper. The two lower premolars are suggested to come out too. So this parent is hearing about upper laterals coming out, two lower premolars coming out, and then, of course, you know, coordinating everything after that. They're not happy to hear that. They come in for our opinion. We take our measurement, transverse expansion, 31 millimeters. Now, 31 millimeters, but remember, that's after having an upper expander. So at 31 millimeters, we are equivalent to about a four-year-old as far as appropriate transverse dimension for growth and development that is considered normal to have excellent occlusion and tongue space, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So of course, we're 31 millimeters. We know it's time for fixed expanders, but upper and lower. And when they get to us and we look like this, we learn that the laterals are slated for extraction, but to accommodate the deficiency now in the upper, because look at the upper with the spacing that's there. If you take out the laterals and then the canines are brought in, that's gonna get a lot smaller. For that to get a lot smaller, the lower premolars are suggested to take out. They decide to change course. So we take over. So we take over and we give them a full expansion of the upper and lower jaw. Now you're looking at a nice expander here because what it has is the markings on the bar. Two, four, six, eight, nine. This is nine millimeters of expander to get that child to 40 millimeters and then some brackets to start to guide those canines in. But the lower gets it too. So you can see the bands here, but the lower has a fixed lower Schwartz. And then with the fixed lower Schwartz, of course, if you're doing nine millimeters of upper expander to get to 40, then you're gonna do eight or nine millimeters of lower expansion to get to 40 and follow along. But meanwhile, once you follow along and you develop a 40 millimeter transverse measurement, you have a room to accommodate all the teeth in the upper and the lower arch. You could put your little lingual bar for the five teeth. So in this case, we kept the three incisors. I didn't go all the way to the fourth incisor because she was 14 and a half really at the time we're meeting her, but now her tongue has a chamber to live in. So that eight or nine millimeters of expansion, when you get that child to 40 millimeters, that's a, that's a distance across the arch where the tongue has room. So you've developed the upper arch, the nine millimeters. You can breathe through your nose. When you develop the lower to follow it along, now the tongue can fully pull into this chamber forward, which means the air can get behind it. So having the air pass through the nose, step one, having the air go by the tongue beautifully. Step two, now the child will sleep breathing through their nose through the night without any resistance, sound, or mouth breathing or worse. A final photograph is here with proper overbite, proper overjet. And with three incisors, you don't get to keep a perfect class one on both sides. You got to lose a little something because you've only got three incisors instead of four. But meanwhile, you're not missing your upper laterals and you're not missing two lower premolars. And all we had to do was redirect the expansion. So can a 14-year-old female have fixed expanders? Certainly. And like Dr. Christensen showed at 17, I've done this up to 19. Turns out any age that ends in teen can have a beautiful fixed expander technique to develop the arches and keep all the teeth which number one, sets the stage for a beautiful home for the tongue, but number two, gives you breathing through your nose just a little bit easier. Here's a list of symptoms for you. So this child comes in and we meet them and we have chronic mouth breathing, snoring, nasal congestion, multiple ear infections and ear tubes, trouble falling asleep, waking every night, morning issues, school struggles, fatigue, has a sleep study, already mild obstructive sleep apnea, has ADHD as a diagnosis and is already on the medications. And then of course, we're 10 years old. So we're at 10 years old suffering with that list. So imagine that list. Look at that list one more time real quick. That list is age 10. And then uh, it's not a coincidence. I don't treat any of that list. Look at that list. That's part of a medical history. That's part of the real struggle. But I don't treat that list. What I do treat is underdeveloped jaws. I treat malocclusion. 
So it turns out we meet the shell, we take some pictures. Whoa, we have well-aligned teeth and a class one bite. So isn't that amazing? So the teeth are kind of where they belong. You would think, well, she doesn't need anything. But the transverse measurement is 33. Now, 33 millimeters is just okay if you're about six years old, because that's the width you would be at a six-year-old range. But when you're 10, 33 is not good. You should be pushing towards 40 if we're going to have all of these teeth properly placed and a proper home for the tongue and nasal airflow, you know, non-resistant nasal airflow. So we need to get to 40 if we're going to make a difference in this child. So that history is significant. So again, it's fixed upper and lower expanders. You could see by the markings on here, two, four, six, eight, we're up to eight millimeters and the lower's following right along. A little bit of bracket and wire for perfect alignment. We take that 33 plus the eight, we're up to 41 millimeters. And then we learn and we talk obviously about progress and how things are going because when you have eight millimeters and you're up to 41, even with the expanders in place at 41 millimeters, that child will start to nasal breathe, sleep better, and start to heal. So we start noticing with the symptoms being gone, we talk about next steps, which are going to be to talk to the physician about the medications, because if the symptoms have faded away, you might not need your medication. And so of course, this is the process that it goes through. We go from 33 to 41. So now we're looking at a 33 millimeter transverse measurement to a 41 millimeter measurement here too, and big difference in the tongue space. On the left side of the screen, you have a 33 millimeter upper transverse measurement, but the lower fits into it. That tongue doesn't fit in that chamber. On the right side, we're up to 41 on top, but the bottom had to follow it. Now the tongue is living in a five bedroom mansion. If the tongue is forward, the air gets by it better. Sure enough, we're here, 33 to 41. But the biggest issue is, of course, that child has started to heal, sleeping, breathing, the medication decreases, they get off the medication. But that child struggling in school was in all kinds of small groups, all kinds of tutors, all kinds of help. Then you get an email from the parent. I wanted to send you a note regarding Molly. We had a meeting on Friday with the educational team regarding Molly's progress in school. She's made huge strides and now has an A average. She's fully integrated into regular math and science classes. There was a time she was pulled out and put in what they would call small group. And that's you know a humiliation really and an embarrassment in the school that she was in. The way that was done is uh, morning homeroom, everybody's in class. And then the announcement is made, all children in small group, it's time to move to your class. And you have to stand up and do the walk of shame past everybody. And I wonder what everybody else is thinking when you have to go to small group and how you might feel walking out of a class being announced that you're going to small group. Wonderful, right? I keep thinking about our conversation years ago. You described your teaching topics and in particular, the focus on the size of the airway and how important it was for sleep. You told us a story of another girl, just like Molly and showed us before and after pictures. The procedure changed this girl's academic career. All weekend, I had flashbacks to that conversation. I wanted to say thanks for the guidance on expanders for Molly. It's been life-changing for her. So of course, that child goes through a full heal and is no longer on medication. Her medication stopped six years ago. Then we get a little older. I know these are the advanced geriatric patients, but if someone doesn't treat them early and someone really needs to pick it up at some point and do it, but this is another example of one direction versus another. So we don't meet Olivia until she's 15, but there's a whole history involved here. So we may as well share it. It highlights the difference between tooth focused and foundation focused. It also highlights the difference between expansive and growth wider and forward versus a retractive technique. So when we get the whole history, it turns out the 15 year old that we're meeting has already had two phases of orthodontics and she's complete. So she, we get the records and here she is at age seven. And these happen to be the records because she was treated by an orthodontic specialist in her own town. And at age seven, this is what they were looking at. So this was the age seven, narrow, vaulted, of course, a little bit of crowding. And then this is the bite. So at seven years, seven months old, these are the records. Phase one is recommended. And this is, happens to be the, the CEF at that age. So we can kind of see what we're looking at. This will be more important in a second when you see differences. So we start learning that, okay, the specialist at the time recommended phase one treatment, and it was 14 months. There was an upper expander only, and here come the results. So this happens to be at age eight years, nine months. So 14 months go by, and she's here. So this is the improvement or difference after having an upper expander only and 14 months of treatment. Let's put them together. So the top is age seven years, seven months, then the bottom is eight years, nine months old. And so you're seeing top to bottom, the pre and post phase one orthodontic changes. And then we're going to eventually have a CEF to show you. So now you can take a look at the difference because these two are taken obviously at seven years, seven months, and then eight years, nine months. So what has happened to this girl in those 14 months? Well, take a look at the left side and you can see on the left side, that's not really the best airway we could have, but it's not the worst we've ever seen. 
And then on the right side, which is post phase one treatment with a retractive technique, of course, you're looking at less space to breathe through. And the most important part of this picture is actually the hyoid bone. If you look at where the hyoid bone is on the left, it is within five millimeters of the mandibular border. The jawline, look at the jawline on the child pre-treatment on the left, pre-treatment. On the right is after a phase one retractive technique. If you retract the jaws, the neck pops out to compensate, the hyoid bone drifts down. And the reason we talk about the hyoid bone is because it's a single risk factor for OSA when it reaches 20 millimeters away from the mandibular border. So if we're pulling things back and that hyoid bone has to compensate and the neck has to pop out and down, you might get to 20 millimeters and produce a single risk factor for OSA. So of course, at this point, even in the CEPH, there's no lip seal now. So the retractive technique has created a situation where the girl cannot breathe well through her nose, cannot sleep well at night, and what was a sleep disorder breathing child to begin with is now worse after 14 months of retractive technique. So the results of this are that the sleep disorder breathing snoring is increasing. She's irritable, unhappy, and an angry child. She's tired. She's napping. She was at seven years old, the, basically the equivalent of a straight A student, but she's gone now to struggling at age coming up on nine and getting extra help to get through school. Now, of course, this child is going to have phase two in the same place. So the records at phase two are here. So 10 years, 11 months old, she has these records to show. And of course, the canines are coming and there's a very mild amount of crowding here. But of course, the phase two treatment is for bicuspid extraction. So like most parents here, well, we've done everything we possibly could in phase one. We did all of the possibilities. And we, since we did everything that was possible, the only alternative now to solve this is to extract the bicuspids. So of course, she has that done. And here it is in progress. So they took out the four bicuspids, continued the retraction and consolidation of the remaining teeth, further making her narrow and trapped. And so here are her final records. So after this successful first two rounds of treatment, this is the day everything is removed and the parents are told, you now have a perfect bite, a perfect everything. This is the best that it, there is to offer. We've taken your braces off. Here are your retainers. And of course, that's when about a few months later, they show up in my office. And so now I have to meet this family after this. And if only that child met Dr. Boyd at age three, none of this would have happened because this could have been handled a lot easier. And at younger ages, it's so much easier. I've got to deal with this now. And then we get this one. Now, if you remember where the hyoid bone was, look at it now. Post phase two, the hyoid bone is now 24 millimeters from the mandibular border. That's a single risk factor for OSA. It should be no surprise this child cannot breathe, cannot sleep, and is a disaster struggling at age 14. That hyoid bone at age seven was up at the mandible four millimeters away. Now we're 24. So look at the neck. Look at where that is. That is a telltale sign of big trouble. You're looking at the results of retractive extraction, retractive orthodontics. So she shows up in our practice looking like this. So she continues to deteriorate because here you have someone who has been through a tooth focused extraction retraction technique, and that's one option. But meanwhile, she didn't need extractions and she certainly didn't need retraction technique. So we're gonna go the other way. So you could see, I got blue spacers in there. Here we go. We're gonna get involved with at age 15 and a half. She came in now by the time she gets to me, upper and lower expander. So fixed expanders are my favorite, but we do take a lot of records and we do make a diagnosis on the frenum and that's been brought up already. Dr. Boyd mentioned collaborative care. It takes a village. So this child, like many others, is going to visit the myofunctional therapist. She's going to have a frenum release. She's going to have myofunctional therapy for the better part of nine to 12 months to correct the soft tissue dysfunction so that we don't have to have a bite that looks like that after having two phases of orthodontic treatment. So here we go in the other direction. Let's go the opposite way. Fixed expanders go in, and of course, we need to go wider and forward. And if that child has sleeping, breathing symptoms and doesn't have room for her tongue, we're going to go all the way back to the beginning and give her back those teeth. So at age 15, we'll take her through full fixed expansion and development of the maxilla. So we will develop the maxilla all the way out, switch her into clear aligner. So she'll go through some fixed expanders, maybe nine months, 10 months to get the expansion of the upper and lower jaw. We'll use a little bit of bracket and wire with springs by the missing premolars to give that chamber back. Then, of course, we'll switch to clear aligners because when you're 15 and a half and you come in and we have to reverse this, it's now you're 16, but then you're 16 and a half, then you're 17. You know where you are. You're a junior in high school now, and you're the only one wearing all this stuff. And it's not fun to be in high school looking like this, especially with braces on at that age. So we do switch to clear aligners pretty rapidly so we can give her back some confidence and some you know, self-esteem walking around and being able to smile. But here the arches are fully developed. Now you've got back to the beginning where you should be. You've had your friend in revision. You've done your myofunctional therapy. 
dad happens to be a dentist. That's how they ended up in our office because he knew there had to be a better way. So dad makes the Maryland bridges. These are bonded ceramic Maryland bridges as a placeholder. Those were made 10 years ago. This is, this is you know, this kid's already out of college, but this is 10 years ago. He puts in those little teeth. Since then, of course, he has replaced them with implants and four crowns. So the good news is this is the difference between what you saw as a phase one and phase two in a specialist's hands to deliver the left side results, subtractive, retractive, extractive, versus let's go back and do it the opposite way. Look at the difference in the maxilla. You can grow the maxilla at age 14, 15, 16, and the mandible because it is upper and lower expanders to grow all the way out. Those are just the ceramic Maryland bridges that are in there. But she now has a better bite and a beautiful occlusion. And thanks to doing not only fixed expanders for growth and development and giving back everything, nasal breathing, sleeping through the night, returning to a straight A student and not having any symptoms that are in that sleep fragmentation or basically sleep disruption category. That child already, and it was about two and a half or three years ago, Marilyn Bridges removed, four fixtures placed, four crowns put on. So she's back to a full human being with all of her teeth where they belong. Then we get to 14 and a half years old, another one. Now, here's a list for you. Again, uh, these are her symptoms and her struggles. It's also a list of things I don't treat. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, headaches, narcolepsy, anxiety, depression, ADHD, insomnia. She's a failed CPAP user. That's how bad things got. Uh, she also has a full history in the digestive category, uh, as well as a full history in the struggles at school, very difficult uh, in school, and also requiring all the way to letters from the medical community to say, grant her more time, give her extra you know, allowances for schoolwork to be able to keep up with other kids. And her story, like many other kids, begins at age three. Because when we take the history and we learn where the struggles begin, the parents will tell you that the symptoms that they're having started at age three and four and sometimes even two. So we know at age three, the child was already struggling with a whole bunch of stuff. So here's how she looks when she comes in. So she is absolutely unhealthy. And this is the picture of unhealthy. So now we're at a point where we meet 14 and a half years old, again, a geriatric patient, but it's a full example of the difference between a tooth focused approach or a foundation focused approach. So here she is 14 and a half, and she has completed her two years of orthodontics, brackets and wires at a specialist location where they straightened her teeth. So her front teeth are well aligned, except a tooth focused approach doesn't accommodate for tongue space and or breathing. So we just get straight teeth and here they are nice and straight. But then we look at this photo and I take this photo a lot. I teach to take this photo a lot. And after you take that photo a lot, you should stare at it a little bit. And then you should wonder, I wonder where that tongue is when she closes her mouth, because that you are looking at a proper size tongue. You're looking at a normal size tongue. You're looking at a tongue that is absolutely average. It is not too big. What you are looking at is underdeveloped jaws. So you're looking at malocclusion of the underdeveloped jaw variety. This girl is really narrow, really narrow, no room for the tongue. 14 and a half years old, scalloped tongue. Scalloped tongue, risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing. Because when she closes her mouth, that tongue could only be in one position and it's posteriorly displaced. Those words, posterior displacement, they're riddled into the sleep disorder breathing and OSA literature because a tongue that is posteriorly displaced interferes with airflow. When the maxilla is really narrow, you can't get your air breathing through the nose going very well. Then, of course, you can't get it behind the tongue. She has both of the problems, like most kids, underdeveloped jaws. Lo and behold, another tight frenum. We find this in a lot of kids. Gets where she's going. Frenum release myofunctional therapy. Takes a village. We do lots of collaborative care. Thank you to the myofunctional therapists out there. I could never do this alone because if you don't have the musculature and the breathing all coordinated with specialists like the myofunctional therapy community, you're going to end up fighting with the opponents, which are the tongue and the lips and the cheeks. Why not make them teammates so the myofunctional therapy community takes what begin as your opponents, the tongue, the lips, and the cheek, and they convert them to teammates. And next thing you know, you have everybody on your side to deliver beautiful results for your child. Now, 29, transverse measurement. The number one diagnostic tool for malocclusion is how narrow you are, 29 millimeters. That's wonderful if you're three years old. A three-year-old measures 29, home run, we're off to the races, let's keep looking at it and seeing how we're going. But when you're 14 and a half and you're 29, you're in a world of pain, which her decade, a decade of suffering in those categories is already documented. Well, we have the lingual bar, so the front teeth won't relapse. That's wonderful that that's in there. I'm very happy about that. So we're going to take her to 38. 
So of course, at 14 and a half year old female can have fixed expanders in the upper and lower jaw. This is the day I removed them. So you could see the little markings where they were, but we delivered an upper fixed expander, took her from 29 to 38. Then we did the lower fixed expander, took her from, well, the upper is 29 to 38, the lower follows it. If the upper goes nine millimeters, the lower is going to go eight or nine as well. So now we have a chamber for the tongue. We've got our width. We've opened up the nasal chamber as well. We go from here to here. This is just fixed expanders, nine months. Upper and lower fixed expanders for nine months, getting nine millimeters of width. And here's how she looks. Now, we've only done the fixed expanders at this point, and she's a completely different child. Every single category that was a symptom or a medical history or a medicated condition for her is reducing and improving and healing. And we're nine months in and she looks completely different. And the difference in the pictures is that she now has a bigger maxilla and a bigger mandible. Both jaws have now been increased in their size. She has now started her myofunctional therapy heading into the frenum release. And all of a sudden we have to switch over to clear aligners are coming next. So what a difference in the maxilla and the mandible. And we're now going from unhealthy to healthy. Next step, clear aligners. Let's go clear aligners. Now, if we go clear aligners, we're going wider because we, we use clear aligners to go wider and forward. So we would take her from 38 to 41, another three millimeters. This just happens to be the full before and after. 29 millimeters to 41. Now, 29 to 38 was the fixed expanders, clear aligners, 38 to 41. When we transfer into the brackets and wires or the clear aligners for final alignment, we're going wider and then the lower as well. So now we have a 41 millimeter transverse measurement and the lower has followed it and we're here. Now we have two different mouths, two different children on our hands. And of course, this is a full grown maxilla and mandible holding all of those beautiful teeth in a wonderful spot. And then we can get a senior year high school picture right here. So this was done a few years ago. So she's already out for a couple of years, but this happens to be her senior photo. She has the big maxilla, the big mandible, which big is the wrong word. We could say normal because now her teeth are housed appropriately. And the difference from a 29 millimeter transverse measurement to a 41 is that now you can breathe through your nose. Now your tongue has a proper space. Releasing the frenum and retraining the tongue with the myofunctional therapy delivers proper tongue function. It'll reduce the lip and cheek activity. It will balance all of the musculature so that child can not only breathe, but totally have all of the oral musculature cooperating with us. The entire system that Dr. Boyd refers to, that cranio, uh, craniofacial respiratory complex, will function appropriately now that it has all the correct dimensions, and that child will totally heal. So the good news is that I can report to you, she no longer has OSA, narcolepsy, insomnia, ADHD, anxiety, depression, or headaches. This child has no medications, is a full heal in all those categories, and I don't treat a single one of those categories. Now, her OSA, when we have more time, we teach this fully, is documented by PSG. The narcolepsy is documented by multiple sleep latency testing. The insomnia is documented by history. The ADHD, of course, documented by history, anxiety, depression, headaches. The full history began at age three to four. This child suffered for a decade. And you got to witness, like many of the other kids tonight, the difference between addressing the transverse dimension versus sagittal. The difference between tooth focused versus, versus foundation focused. The difference between extractive or retractive or subtractive and expansive. If you deliver the jaw growth and development wider and forward, not only get to have all the teeth where they belong, you do get proper nasal breathing, proper tongue space. If you include the myofunctional therapy community in your treatment, you also get to enjoy the frenum releases as necessary and the full cooperation of the musculature to not only help you get where you need to be, but to help that child to thrive for the rest of their life. That will be a healthy child for the rest of her life. So I don't mind working on the geriatric kids, but oh boy, wouldn't it have been nice if any of those kids could have been treated at three or four? That's really the message. These children shouldn't have had to wait until 10, 13 and a half, 14, 14 and a half to be treated by me or anyone out there. While it's totally possible, we still need to do it, but why aren't we treating at three to four? A lot of these problems could have been solved earlier. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was amazing. And that's a great question. Why, why don't we treat earlier? And that's really what we want to bring to light today and just have some rational thinking uh, and some clinician, uh, clinical judgment. And um, we're thrilled with the work you do. Uh, Dr. Moralia, thank you so much for sharing and the lives that you've changed for good. It's I'm sure you have just stories about where they are now that just make you really sleep well at night. <laughs> so thank you so much. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. Anything to help a child. So happy to share. Yeah. Thank you.
Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Steve Karstensen, and Dr. Steve Karstensen is the co-founder of Premier Sleep Associates, a dental practice dedicated to treating obstructive sleep apnea and snoring. After graduating from Baylor College of Dentistry in 1983, he and his wife, Midge, a dental hygienist, started a private practice of general dentistry in Texas before moving to native Seattle in 1990. In 1996, he achieved the fellowship in the Academy of General Dentists in recognition of over 3,000 hours of advanced education in dentistry, with an increasing amount of time in both practice and classwork devoted to sleep medicine. A lifelong educator himself, Dr. Steve is currently the sleep education director for both Hankey Institute and Spirit Education, recognized as among the finest places for dentists to further their education. And he's also on the task force of the pediatric um, dentistry with the ADA. So we're looking forward to learning more about that. Welcome, Dr. Carstensen. You are the leader in this charge. So we really um, are excited to have you on with a call to action for all of our listeners. Well, thank you, Lauren. And again, thank you for putting this together. And the speakers we saw before here certainly showed the possibilities of things that we have to think about. And Ben said it so well, these kids were, were suffering for a decade or more. And he didn't treat any of the medical problems that were listed because of the nature of what we do is we're trying to get the kids back into homeostasis. Homeostasis could be my favorite word. It's the it's the concept that the body wants to heal itself, wants to get back to healthy. It's the return to normal. It's the resistance to the compromise, to the adaptations that's required when somebody has a problem with their fundamental physiology. And there's really nothing more fundamental than breathing. In 2018, when I hosted the first ADA Children's Airway Initiative meeting, I opened it with this quote because I just loved what I found when I went looking. And look at this quote. It says everything Ben and Kevin and, and Brad have said. Many of the things that we need can wait. But the children can't. The things that they need, they need now. Their, their, their bones are being formed. Their blood are being made. Their senses are being developed. We can't say, you know, well, when we get to it or they'll grow into it or come back and see me later on when all the teeth are in. We can't say those things because today is when those children need to breathe better. Now, we may not be able to take a three or four year old and put them in expanders and make them breathe better that night. We may not be able to solve their behavior problems, you know, within days, but we don't have to wait decades, do we? And when does this quote, I, I feel so Kevin Boydish when I looked at the time of this quote, because uh, Gabriel Mistral, the poet, wrote that in 1957. Uh, guys, that quote is as old as I am. And that's how long we've been able to, for the poets in our society to know what to do. Kevin tells us that professionals have known for over 100 years. Kevin says that for 150 years ago, they were writing about the expansion of the jaws and the importance of nasal breathing. The poets tell us for, for uh, now, you know, 66 years that we have to pay attention. So the time is not, it's not a new thought to get started early. It's an old thought. It's an old thought we have to bring, bring back because our fellow professionals are sometimes mired in the in the, in the same thing, and they're not thinking about homeostasis. So let me see if I can get this to move. There we go. So how are we going to make a difference? We expect change. You know, every one of us that teaches a group of dentists, we expect change. We don't hope for change. We don't present stuff and say, well, it's out there now. Let's see what happens. No, we have, we're actively expecting you to change. Now, I know who I'm talking to. I looked over the chat numbers, the chat names. I am happy to greet many, many people that I've made friends with over the years. And certainly I see I'm on tons of these webinars because all of you guys that have signed into this uh, webinar to take advantage of this, you're not here for the free CE. You're not here to, to because you have nothing else to do on a Wednesday night. You're here because you want to change. You want to make a change in yourself. You want to make a change in your community, and you want to make a change in your fellow professionals. We have challenges with that. We have to make an example of what we can do in our communities, and what does that do? That changes what the moms want. So when we think about what we're going to be able to do to have an impact, 
when our colleagues are not yet educated, Kevin says that there's a deficiency in a dental education. When the, our colleagues get out in the world and they face the business realities of seeing a busy practice, when they hear about things out there, but they don't have time to get to it. And then we have moms that knock on the door and say, I've heard about this, or my friend had this, or my friend over there in the East Coast took their 13-year-old in for a second opinion, and man, what a difference. Well, then that that sister in Phoenix or that cousin over there in Salt Lake City is going to go knocking on the door of those, their professionals and say, I'm hearing that there's a better way to do this. So the people on this call are here to change. They're here to make changes in themselves. They're here to make changes in their practice. But it's hard because as we go into dealing with our fellow professionals, as we go into thinking new thoughts, there's challenges involved. But you know what? We don't do anything because it's easy. We do it because they're the rewards at the other end. We do it because we want to be able to tell those moms that come back and they say that their child is so much healthier. Well, we want to just be able to thank those mothers. I'm saying mothers. I don't mean just mothers. But we thank the guardians, the parents, the the, the people taking care of the people making the decisions to go a different route, to ask for better care, to think about it uh, from a four dimensional standpoint. It's not just transverse. It's not just sagittal. It's not just vertical. It's also over time. And so when they demand a better answer, then that challenge becomes more rewarding. That challenge becomes harder to face up to, but it's not easy. It's just something we, we do. So I got to show you this. So after the ADA Children's Conference, there is a number of people decrying the effectiveness of that conference online. And Dr. Boyd shared one with me in a popular orthodontic forum. I will not tell you who this orthodontist is, but this is the after case. It looks like one of Ben's before cases. And uh, oftentimes when you hear Dr. Moralia talk a lot, and I'm sure it's true for Dr. Christensen, I'm not quite as familiar there, but Ben often says, you know, these are the before cases for me, but the after cases for some other orthodontist. And we saw clear examples of that in his presentation. But this is the after case. I'm not going to go through this, but you can all see the deficiencies here. You can all see what this orthodontist was satisfied with. I bet you that if we had any chance at a history here, we would hear some of the same complaints that, that, that were common for the 10 and the 13 year olds there, the 17 year olds at Dr. Christensen's office. So this, you know, so look at this. This was presented, this was a simple case for this orthodontist because he knew what he could do. You know, he took out some teeth, he moved some teeth around, he, he you know, came up with a good bite. I mean, this for him is a, is a great uh, answer for this uh, young patient. But, and this is what you're gonna be finding in your community, however. When you go back to your communities and you go, go out in the world and you say, okay, orthodontist, I need some help with this. I'm not gonna do the braces on this case. case. I, need to I don't know how to do an expander. And I wanted you to do this. Well, they may, if they have a similar kind of kind of mindset, you're going to find resistance. This, these are quotes from, the, from this orthodontist, a real orthodontist, an RO, and he said these things. You can read them there, I, I, but it just makes me shake my head that it's 2023. You know, adults, number one cause of being overweight. Now, that's my area, guys. I don't treat little kids. I am so passionate about this, but you heard from the people who can treat it. Uh, but I treat adults. And the number one cause, guys, not being overweight. That's not it. So we have a little bit of a lack of understanding here, but a loud voice. And that's going to be true in your community as well. You will find professionals, other dentists, other um, uh, uh, primary care dentists, you'll find orthodontists, you'll find sleep physicians, you'll find primary care physicians. And they have a loud voice because they want to defend themselves. They feel like that's their role is to hold out for, you know, what's true and right and, you know, and, uh, and supported by all the evidence-based medicine that they have no way to know what it is. But they'll say these kind of things. And orthodontics has nothing to do with OSA. It's been proven over and over worldwide for years. Okay, I'm not so sure that that's a true statement. You'll also find resistance because look at this, Kevin's favorite thing. He talks about this over and over again because Kevin is correct. 
And But this is what the Orthodox might tell you when you go back to their offices and say, look, I have a four-year-old, I have a seven-year-old, I have a small child who needs to grow a little bit more because we only have 24 millimeters. We're not up to the numbers that we need. We have these benchmarks that make sense. We have these benchmarks that allow a child to develop the foundation, the bone support, the bone support that controls the airway, the bone support that allows us to have a beautiful set of teeth and a nice bite and a beautiful occlusion. I like all those things, but it's the bone that allows that. And if we don't see past the teeth, then we're going to only see the lack of a crossbite. And this is what they've taught for so long, but that's not what they need to be able to know. And when you knock on the door and you say, I have a seven-year-old in trouble, and they say, well, wait a minute, there's no crossbite. I'm not doing any expansions. What is this with a, with a, what's that silliness with the, with the uh, cotton roll between your teeth? I don't, I don't understand any of this. Well, obviously, you're not in the right orthodontist office. Now, here's my favorite one that he said. Now, there was a number of things he said. I didn't put them all up on the screen. But after decrying all of these things, after going on for uh, pages on this, this uh, particular thread uh, where other people were chiming in saying, well, well, wait a minute. And other people were saying, well, yeah, you're right. So there was a plus and minus going on there. More, more minuses, by the way, guys, I'm happy to say than there were you know, kudos to this guy. This is what he said. I have no clue what a bears or a stop bang is. All right. Well, you know what? Many, many people on this uh, webinar tonight have taken some kind of a sleep class. Uh, they've taken some kind of an orientation to obstructive sleep apnea for adults, for kids. What's going wrong? How do you find these patients? The American Dental Association says we're supposed to be screening all of our patients for breathing problems. That means in an adult practice, a stop bang. That means in a child's practice currently, bears, pretty good screener. I'm sleepy is another one. There's the pediatric sleep questionnaire. The American Dental Association says we are on the lookout for people who don't breathe well, adults and children. Well, if this orthodontist is willing to say, orthodontics has nothing to do with OSA, kids, it's tonsils, adenoids, adults, it's, it's being overweight. We don't have any way to do this. Expansion is not for anything but yet he has no clue what a bears or a stop bang is, well, then I don't believe that this orthodontist has spent much time understanding our field. I think he is not up on the current events, but he's willing to say that. So that might be true in your community as well. So one of the hard things we have to do is overcome these kind of resistance, and you do that with knowledge base. You do this by listening to the leaders in the field like Kevin Boyd, Ben Morali, and Brett Christensen, and taking classes after classes and, and hearing what Lauren Gates has to say with Airway Health Solutions and other great ways of learning about this, because that's what we're going to do. This was in Chicago two weekends ago. These are the learners in the room. This happens to be a little exercise that's, that a, a, a myofunctional therapist, speech and language pathologist was putting us through. She was teaching us some breathing exercises. But So look at the faces here. You know, you might even recognize some of the faces there. There's some very popular leaders there. and But they're busy. They're, they're cooperating. They're wanting to do this. They're, they're wanting to learn. And that's you guys, too. If you could have been there, maybe some of you were there in Chicago, but I was so excited to be there because this is it. And then when Dr. Shepley came down and greeted all of us in front of the room and said, wow, you guys are really doing the right thing. What, a, what a, an endorsement. You know, so when you go back to your communities, you go to your study clubs, you go to your colleague across the hallway, you go to your pediatric uh, primary care dentist, you go to your other primary care dentist, you go to your orthodontist, you don't have to think you're standing alone. And you're not standing just in front of, of experts who, who goad you on like Ben Morali and Kevin Boyd to go out and do better in the world. You're there with, in, with 190,000 other dentists from the ADA backing you up. So you're not weird. You're not strange. You're not on the fringe. You're not doing something that's not correct. You're doing something that's more correct. So when you see the resistance, when you hear the other orthodontists, the people who are stuck in the old ways, resist what you want to do. Yeah, you're on the right side of history here. You're doing the right thing for your population. And you have to do that with smaller groups. 
So in your teams, in your offices, you get together and you say, how are we going to make a difference here? What are we going to do next for the next child coming in? How are we going to talk to this parent? What information do we have to have? Do we need a brochure? Do we need to put some videos together? Do we need to gather some educational information? Do we need to study what's on the market these days? Do we need to know? What do you need to know? Work with your team because in any uh, primary care office, in any primary care pediatric dental offices, it's the team that makes the difference. Us doctors uh, that are, I'm talking to the dentists here, the physicians here, we know a lot. Sure we do, but we don't communicate as well as our colleagues do in our offices, the people sitting next to us and across from us and around the corner from us. They communicate in ways that we can't. Of course, we communicate in ways they can't too, but it all works together to make sure that we are able to get the message out there for everybody to make that change, to address that challenge, to, to talk to that parent and say, I know what you've heard before, that it's after age seven. I know what you've heard, wait till middle school. I know that all the other families or kids aren't getting braces yet, but I'm telling you, your child has a list of problems that I think um, that uh, might stem from a breathing disorder. And if we can do something about breathing, we get the fundamentals of physiology in order. And that's where we're going with all these things. So as you consider how you're going to run your practice, how you're going to make a difference in your, in your community, don't limit yourself. You know, don't think, oh, well, you know, there's so much to learn. I can't do this. I'm not good with kids. I don't know how to do this. No, dream big. If you're not good with kids and you don't want to learn that stuff, then, then find somebody who is and partner with them. You know, make a solid commitment to saying, I'm not going to let any families come through my practice without asking about their children's breathing. I'm going to make sure that if I, that I know everybody in my community that has the resources to make a difference in those families' lives, because you make a difference in those children, sure. You know, those kids that have those lists of medical problems and guys, wasn't that sad to see all those? And then you see all those things and you go, I'm not going to treat that, but I'm going to make sure this child's respiration, this child's physiology, this child's ability to manage the world is the best it can be. And if I can't do it, I'm going to find somebody who can, and I'm going to be a fierce advocate for those families getting over to those right people. Set some goals. Make sure that you're screening everybody. Make sure you're asking questions about respiration, breathing, and, and habits, and looking at their posture, and all the other wonderful things we can learn from groups like this. Set some goals about making sure that you're not going to let that any more families slip through your practice and wonder why you didn't say something five years ago. You can't go back five years and recorrect that, but you can make sure that you, five years hence, you haven't let anybody get to five years older and suffer for five more years. And then take some action. You know, go out and speak to a group. Uh, get some, Take some education. Get some books. Read some incredible resources that we have. Watch some videos. All the things you can do to make sure that your team is up to speed. I do a little bit of that, stevecarsonsondds.com. I am not the best pediatric uh, teacher in the world. You've heard those uh, prior to this talk right here. But I have a little bit to say, and, and I'm happy to guide you to the right people anytime you want. So I have long had this quote on my wall. This one drives me because it says, whatever you can do or dream you can do, begin it. Take action. Boldness. Moving forward. Doing something has genius power and magic in it. Because when you take action, when you go out and make a difference, when you are brave enough to take on a challenge and do something because it's hard and celebrate with your team afterwards, call up your mentor that you heard Ben Morales speak, and man, that really jazzed you up, and you go out and do something and have a great reward come. Your family that you helped says, well, I never heard that before. I am so thankful that you told me that. Call up your mentor and say, and share that reward with them. Share it with your team. Share it with your family. Share it with your colleagues. Because when that magic happens, that reward that spurs you on to make sure you're not going to let any more kids go through your practice that way. So that's the thing you can do. That's the thing that we're commanded or you know directed to do by the American Dental Association. We're supported in it. There's nothing you can do that that's uh, that's off the charts for helping your families in in lives by um, paying attention to their airway. And so go out and do these things and create magic in your own practice. It's wonderful.
Now I got a pitch, the Collaboration Cures coming up next month. We're going to have a ton of people to, sp talking about airway in many different ways, speech and language pathologists, physical therapists, and functional medicine doctors and dentists. And, uh, and we're going to study how airflow through the nose is with rhinomanometry, all kinds of interesting things. So go to aapmd.org and have a look at Collaboration Cures. Come see us in, in, um, in Orlando in September. All right, Lauren, there we are. How are we doing? Back. Wow, we're doing, I am so impressed. Number one, you guys are like point on with timing. It's like 9.02. I'm so like proud of everybody because I know there's so much to say and we can just extrapolate, you know, to another week if we could. Um, I'm so inspired by everybody here. I'm so inspired by our attendees who are with us still, 256, um, you know, almost towards the end. I, what I would love to do is for um, Dr. Boyd and Dr. Christensen to come back on camera. And Dr. Carsonson, I can't thank you enough for your inspiring uh, call to action. I love that. Dream big, set goals, take action. This is what Ben and I did five years ago. We're having our fifth birthday. It all started with an idea. We dreamt this, you know, I dreamt the airway palooza, literally, you know, we're going to have another one, but, you know, we're one person, each person here is one person who can make such a difference and collectively, we can all come together, set goals, and taking action sometimes is scary, and that can bring about inertia. But that's the worst thing you can do. You're not going to feel good about yourself. You're not going to feel good professionally. You're going to feel kind of stuck. So we're here to help you um, with our faculty, with all these meetings coming up. And I'll go over that after we have our panel discussion. But what I really am looking forward to is there were the title of this was Breaking Boundaries and um, Busting Some Myths. So what myths do you think we busted? And I'm going to come up with some of my summaries. And I would love for us to talk about it is, um, I don't know, Dr. Boyd, are you with us yet? Because I'll, I'll skip over your part, but maybe come on camera. Uh, I'll, I'll come back to that. But um, let's focus on um, Dr. Brett and Dr. Ben, where we're always told that extractions are necessary. I think that's a pretty prominent myth because we hear that all the time. Dr. Morali, you were referring to that in your case where that was the only last resort, right? They tried everything. So what would you what would you um, chime in on from your experience and your opinion? This is your opinion about um, the myth of extractions are necessary. Yeah, the, uh, the, the issue with extraction orthodontic technique is that there is zero focus on the foundation. So when you're focused on the teeth only, if you are tooth focused, then you see too many teeth or you see the big teeth or you see they don't fit or you see the crowding is excessive. And then it's very difficult to make those fit given the tools you have. So if you're tooth focused and your tools are brackets and wires, well, brackets and wires are not expansive and they don't have an effect on the foundation for growth. So you're dealing with a tool that can give you retractive and or distalization type techniques but when the crowding is excessive, braces don't deliver for organizing 28 teeth in a small foundation. So now you've got a, a underdeveloped foundation. You're staring at these teeth, but in order to take the teeth out, you need your diagnostics to fit that mold. And so we turn to the ceph and we see that the cephalometric tracings are usually what the parents will come back. And we have the conversations about, well, you know, give us the conversation that led to the recommendation for extractions or why were they taken out? And they say one after the next, well, the, the orthodontist would put up the profile x-ray. We know it's a cephalometric x-ray with the lines on it. And they would say, all these lines indicate that the teeth don't fit. And I've heard everything from the teeth are too big, there's too many teeth, they can't fit, you have to have teeth out, well, this tells us which ones and how many, and all that nonsense. But meanwhile, that's a tooth-focused approach. So my experience for 20 years has been, not only don't we take any teeth out, our focus is not on the sagittal component, and then you focus on your transverse component, because when you solve the transverse component, it turns out you relieve the sagittal component. Now, I know Dr. Boyd used my little reference before, which I love saying it over and over, and I'm happy. I wish everybody would say it. The maxilla is your criminal. The mandible is your victim. But I'll take it one step further. Your transverse dimension is your criminal. Your sagittal dimension is your victim. Because here's what happens in my world for 20 years. When I correct the transverse appropriately, the sagittal issue disappears. But you can't do it the other way. If you go for sagittal only, 
you can make no difference in the transverse. So attacking the transverse and doing it correctly, which I want to get to in a moment, will give you a sagittal solution. But going after a sagittal solution can't affect the transverse. Now, the transverse correctly, it means upper and lower expanders almost always. So I don't have an example in 20 years of using an upper expander only, but it's just my technique. And I know some people have very good success with a single expander. However, when I'm looking at the children, their measurements, and then their histories and symptoms fading away, and you start tracking a little bit of that. Remember, I don't treat the list of symptoms. I treat the underdeveloped jaws. What I recognize is that a healthy child that is beyond uh, you know, any medication and any symptoms and any medical history, that begins at 40 millimeters at the transverse mark. You need to get three and 14, 40 millimeters apart. And when they come in measuring 30 and 28 and 32, you can't do that with an upper only. So I need an upper and a lower if we're looking to take that child to full development. And then what it translates into 20 years later is that most of the kids I treat have 32 teeth. Because when you hit 40 and above, the anthropology research will show you that a fully developed human skull has 32 teeth when you have 45 millimeters between three and 14. That's a minimum. So a minimum of 45 will give you 32 teeth most of the time. So I now have, most of the kids I treat have 32 teeth because we go for 40 as a minimum. And it turns out at 40 and above is when the symptoms disappear, the medications disappear, the child can breathe and sleep beautifully. So the myth about extracting teeth, it, it really is based on a tooth focused approach and a sagittal first approach. If you're gonna be tooth focused and you're gonna focus on sagittal, your sagittal technique will never correct a transverse deficiency. But wild how when you correct a transverse deficiency, the AP goes away. So when we correct children and teach it in a full course, we have the 10 and 12 millimeters of overjet to show. And that overjet goes away by both jaws coming forward without elastics. So yes, absolutely, the transverse discrepancy creates the sagittal discrepancy. It's not the other way around. A transverse discrepancy gives you your trapped mandible. Narrow upper, trapped mandible. So you treat the transverse and you don't have need for ex extractions. When you treat the foundation first, you don't have to take any teeth out. And what's more, you'll enjoy wisdom teeth. You'll enjoy 32 teeth. So you may as well develop the whole child. You can do it almost at any age, but appropriately three to four, because why should the child suffer for 10 years in the symptom category? Brett, I know you've got more to say on this too. Sorry, I went so long. Oh, it's great. I know you're chomping at the bit for that one and we appreciate that. Dr. Christensen, what's your opinion on that, that the myth of extractions are necessary because you hear it as well. Well, I hear it and, and I lived it and I did it. But, um, you know, what's interesting is that uh, Ben's so articulate and I, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm uh, in the presence of giants when I listen to him talk because he can talk so fast and I'm from Idaho and I talk slower. But uh, oh, good. We love you, Dr. Anyway, um, you know, what's interesting is that, I mean, we're talking about pediatrics and in the world of orthodontics, they, and I, it was ingrained in us that, you know, girls, by the time you're 16, you are done growing, you cannot grow them anymore. And boys, by the time they're 18, you are done growing, you can't grow them anymore. I have women in their mid twenties and early thirties that I've done a rapid pedal expander on. And I pick those patients by their skeletal structure and their bone structure. You know, if I have a, and, and this is just my observation, but if I have a sumo, you know, somebody from Samoa that has this big bony structure, I'm probably not going to get uh, uh, things done with a rapid pedal expander. Um, but as we look at adults, I'm expanding adults at 70 years old that have been struggling with airways and breathing things breathing issues. And I'm doing it with the Schwartz with slow um, expansion, remodeling the maxilla. And I didn't, you know, this is like voodoo in the in the orthodontic world. Um, I know Dr. Boyd, he uses Schwartz appliances on little kids. And it's, it's I don't think there's any one magic appliance that um, can be done. Um, it's whatever works the best in your hands. For me, on little kids, it's a fixed appliance, and I have I have put in fixed expanders on two-year-olds and three-year-olds. I have a hard time on one-year-olds because I don't have any teeth, um, but I'd love to do that. And one of the things I would like to know from um, these guys that um, I'm thinking, okay, we we struggle with um, we want to get in on these kids as early as possible. Is there some type of a 
myofunctional or manipulative thing that we could do on babies that we know are tongue tied and are maxillary deficient before they have teeth, you know, like getting our hands in there and doing oral massage or something like that to stimulate growth and, and be even better than we are at two and three years old. Cause I have grandkids that came in at, I mean, that I saw at six months old that were mouth breathers. Um, and as soon as I could get on the teeth, I was, I was jumping in there and doing um, what we were, were talking about. So this, this whole thing about, you know, do we um, have to pull teeth? If I haven't had to pull teeth in 10 years and I'm taking adults that are coming in at 40 and 50 years old with, with a significant amount of crowding and I'm spending two years of doing um, arch development and growth of their maxilla and their mandible, and then when I put braces on them, it literally takes half or a quarter of the time that it did when somebody came in and I just put braces on and tried to line the teeth without developing the foundation. Um, so um, we need to throw out the education that we learned. And um, if, you, if, you, if you're struggling with this, um, I hate to say this, but you just gotta jump in and do it. And uh, um, as soon as you start treating patients and you see the results, and you see the, I mean, I had a 72 year old lady that um, I saw here a couple months ago. And uh, I said, so how are things going with your short supply? And she goes, I'm, I'm 72 years old. I have never slept with my mouth closed until the last six months. And she goes, I'm sleeping so much better. And she goes, I can't believe I waited 72 years to do this. And, uh, you know, and so throw out all this stuff that, you know, you can't fit the teeth in and, and, uh, um it's hogwash so sorry that's coming from the idaho guy dr carsonson yeah. i want to add something to that because of what he said about the little ones and at the ada conference last weekend we had a product there called mile munchie and uh that may be familiar to a lot of people but it, i wasn't terribly uh, familiar with it but what Mary was telling us about that was it's a great uh, substitute for a pacifier. It's a great substitute to help little ones, even without teeth there, Brett, uh, to start to work their their muscles to manipulate those bones. And I think coming intrinsically is a better idea than putting you know some kind of external force on it because we teach them how to swallow then many, many times a day that tongue uh, shapes that bone. And that's, that's the cool part, I think. Can I have a myth for you, Lauren? Yeah, please go for it. I know it. you want to get to these questions. There's some wonderful questions. No, this is actually, I know there are, but I think we're going to have to have a separate town hall meeting with all these questions. And I know everyone's willing. I would love to just focus on the myths and hear your opinions on them for, for this evening. So this may not be an official myth, but what I, I see too much is dentists focusing on what dentists know how to do. And Ben says it, we, we see the teeth, we fix the teeth. If you're an orthodontist, you straighten the teeth. If you're a restorative dentist, you fit, you do surgery on the teeth. If you're a, a hygienist, you clean the teeth. And so we think about the teeth and and because that's the only part uh, that we are trained in. But we ha can't forget that from our general um, dental training, we had an anatomy course, the hygienist had an anatomy course. There's a whole lot of things ar around the oral cavity that we're also responsible for. And so the myth is, is that dentists treat the teeth in the gums, maybe. But uh, but the reality is we treat the teeth, the gums, the palate, the nose, the back of the throat. We treat all of those things. And ultimately, we actually treat all parts of the body. Now, we don't treat them, Ben, like, like we don't give a prescription for a, a problem, but we can't separate the uh, benefits of a good, solid, open airway, a nice occlusion, all the wonderful things that we can do from the effects it has on the rest of the body. So that's what I mean by treating is we allow the body to, what you said, treat itself when we remove the restrictions, but we can't do that if we only think about what dentists can do. So the myth of dentistry is that we treat the oral cavity. The reality is we treat the whole body. Great point, thank you. Dr. Boyd, I wanna talk about a myth that you brought up um, by introducing the concept of they'll grow out of it or a way to treat. Can you share with you what the argument would be for waiting to treat? What can you, can you come up with something? <laughs> the, the, the argument is, you know, 
Like, what if he won't open his mouth? That's really what I always pose as a question. What if they won't open their mouth? Well, that is, I think, one of the biggest obstacles to care. And what if the kid won't open his mouth? Well, I'm a pediatric dentist. That doesn't bother me. I'd be out of business if I if that was something that bothered me. But I was, you know, first trained didactically in it, you know, just the the, the theory that surrounds children who are obstinate. And you know what? Kids are hardwired to want to please the adults, the the the, the tribal leaders, the it's hardwired in our genes. The cultural anthropologists have known this forever. And this was, they didn't call it that, but this was part of my pediatric dentistry training. You don't finish our program unless you demonstrate competence that you know what to do when a child and parent are anxious. And it really was it within the realm of shot, of, of you know, injections and drills and restorative dentistry. It had nothing to do with ortho. No, but everybody knew you didn't do ortho till they were, you know, nine or 10 or 11. And, and you don't have to worry about anxiety then. So I, I don't know, Lauren. I just, I think that is the biggest obstacle to care is the perception that what if they won't open their mouth? And well, you can't do anything. So I, I that's maybe too simple of an answer. But anybody, you know, most people who graduate from orthodontic residency training programs, they're either not married or they're young married. They have no kids or very little kids. They don't have experience at being a parent. I'm saying anybody who is an adult and has grandkids, nieces, nephews, works around, you know how to deal with kids. You could be retrofitted for this. I graduated from my pedo training and I wasn't married, I didn't have kids, but I learned all these techniques that they're just, it's not rocket science. And once you overcome that, then you will allow yourself to say, oh my God, this won't self-correct. I should do something. But if you don't know how to do it, you're just gonna say, look, it shouldn't be done. It's just easier. That's how you sleep at night. Wonderful, thank you. And I think the third myth is really that dentists aren't responsible for pediatric orthodontists. They just need to refer by seven. Um, Dr. Carstensen, you wanna chime in on that? Well, you know, yeah, because the primary care dentists, the primary care pediatric dentists are trained also by their orthodontist friends not to send them over younger, right? Because that's how we're all taught. Well, what we have to do is get brave. And then we have to, uh, what I tell families in my practice is, if look, if your kid uh, is going, needs, you know, some help, go to the orthodontist that they're seeing and say, what will this do to help my child breathe better? And if they don't have an answer for that, or they try and hem and haw your way around, you need to find a different orthodontist, you know? And so that's what I think about that is, it, is that we need to put the families in knocking on the door saying, what's your, what's your answer? And I'm not going to be happy unless you give me an answer that's, you know, that's aligned with breathing. I can add to that one. Oh, please, please. Just a little, yeah, to add to uh, Kevin's answer with the, um, the myth of treating earlier, why not? Uh, the more time you're in this, the more you start realizing history and you put a puzzle together. So it turns out that uh, a few decades ago, there was a, a push, a little bit of pressure to do earlier treatment. Uh, and what happened was the ortho specialty did research to see would it be worthwhile. And the research was no less than 32 different projects were undertaken. So you, you had 32 papers published and you had uh, uh, crazy numbers of kids treated with early treatment. So the early phase one research began. But what happened was uh, an upper expander was used and then it was removed, and then they did their measurements, and they determined that it's wildly unsuccessful, meaning when you use an upper expander and you try early treatment, then when you get to like phase two, a little bit older, and you check the child had reverted back to where they started. So what came of the 32 research projects on early treatment was that it doesn't provide any benefit. So there's no reason for us to be doing anything earlier because what we recognized was that our treatment ended up relapsing to the starting point. So now we have no gain. Why would we want to do something? So it was basically the defense of why aren't we doing anything? Well, here, the conclusion of those 32 papers from the specialty viewpoint was that 
it's ineffective to work early because you can't leave it in there forever. You know, if you're going to treat early, you can't. So you, you take out your work. What happens? It goes back. Okay. The real conclusion is this. If you've got 32 projects that show early intervention was ineffective, you should dig a little deeper. Number one, the biggest problem was an upper expander only. So it turns out if you have a posterior crossbite, you can use an upper expander to correct the posterior crossbite. And that will hold because the interlock of the teeth prevents it from reverting back to crossbite. But that's a small subset of children have a posterior crossbite. The larger subset of children are underdeveloped because really any child that isn't going to grow all the way to 32 teeth where they belong without symptoms, nasal breathing, sleeping through the night, you have an underdeveloped child. That's the only category of child that is fully developed. Jaws big, 32 teeth, and no symptoms, nose breathing. That's a fully developed child. Any other child's underdeveloped. So the largest subset of kids who are underdeveloped looking for early treatment, if you don't have a posterior crossbite and you put an expander on top only, you can only go three to four millimeters because no one is going to push those top teeth outside of the bottom teeth. So an upper expander only going three to four millimeters, guess what happens when you take it away? The upper will go back to the lower. You're exactly where you started. So the, the correct result of the research was that an upper expander only is absolutely useless because you can only go three to four millimeters without a posterior crossbite. The child will revert right back to the start. Now, you know what's missing also from those projects? 32 research papers showing totally ineffective results doing early treatment, upper expander only. So you don't have a lower. Obviously, you're going nowhere with two to three or four millimeters when the child measures 28, 30. You're nowhere near appropriate size. Number two, no attention to frenum, no attention to myofunctional therapy, no attention to breathing, no attention to musculature. None of the things that got you underdeveloped in the first place, weak and dysfunctional musculature, are attended to. So it turns out when you do orthodontics early and you don't address breathing and musculature, guess what happens? Relapse. And that is the same exact reason at 13 and 14. When you do braces late from 12 to 15, you can wear braces for years. If you stop wearing your retainer, guess what's happening? Right back. And all of the kids relapse, not a few, all of them. The relapse rate for traditional ortho, bracket and wire, age 12 to 14 is tremendous. Enough to give birth to billions of dollar industries called clear liners. Because every adult that ever had braces, if you ask them, they'd say, I lost my retainer, my teeth went back. Of course they did. You didn't attend to the cause, the musculature and the breathing. So now all of a sudden you have these, this wealth of research, but you have a poor conclusion. Early treatment doesn't work. That's the worst conclusion you could make from that research. What you can conclude is an upper expander only, useless. Ignoring the frenum, useless. That's a bad technique. Myofunctional therapy is the answer for part of this. So you look at that research and it's favorable research because it proves what doesn't work. And it has been what they have stood on to say, this is why we don't do early work because it's useless. No, you missed the point. All that research points to, you need both expanders to get both jaws where they belong. You need to address the frenum, the musculature and the breathing. And then you don't collapse because the kids that I treat when we go all the way out and I know Brett has the same result and Kevin has the same result. When you do collaborative care and you bring them to where they belong, they don't relapse. So we don't have the kids falling back to where they you know, started. So there's part of the resistance to early treatment in that they actually did the research to show it doesn't work. And what it really showed was an upper expander only useless. And we didn't do anything with the breathing or the musculature or the frenum. So I, I love the research because it helps me know that what I'm doing is correct. I just needed to draw proper conclusions from it. The worst conclusion from that research was early treatment doesn't work. Yeah, that's, that's oh, very important. Okay. If I could say, look in, I don't know if everybody can see this, but everything that Ben just taught us, there's a video by Sean Carlson, uh, board to ABO academic clinically practicing orthodontist in San Francisco, who says, it just completely supports with research from Boston University uh, about maxillary transverse deficiency. Everything you just said, Ben, you, and I don't know if you've seen this video, it's going to blow your mind and it supports yet, everything. I'm going to watch it now. Boy, I'm happy. I just made that stuff up. <laughs> well, it was good. Uh, it was good. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Boyd, what was the name of the, of the doctor? Uh, Dr. Sean, S-E-A-N, Carlson, he's a brilliant academic orthodontist uh, and completely in this short video just dispels every myth about posterior crossbites uh, being compulsory to diagnose maxillary transverse deficiency. It's 
a word that starts with bull has an S in the middle. <laughs> it's not bullseye. Okay. It is so good. <laughs> so I put the link there. Oh, you did. Wonderful. Thank you for yeah. that. And also, yeah. um, let's talk about some strides that we've made, Dr. Carstensen, with the ADA and that brochure. So we're going to put that link in there also. Um, that This is just the beginning, don't you believe? Yeah. The uh, it, it, Again, back to 2018, they said, we, we don't have a brochure about this. And so Lauren... Uh, um, we I got together with some uh, writers and uh, Glenine Varga. I don't know if you, many people know who Glenine Varga is. She's a a leader in education. Has been around for a long time. One of my close friends. And we got together. And we said, let's make something that speaks to people. That gives the dentist a, a tool to use to communicate with families. And so the point of the brochure is to sponsor is to prompt questions. It's not an education, you know, look for these items and you're in trouble. It's not a score. It's a, uh, a, a, a conversation starter. And so if my, a family gets this brochure, goes home and says, wait a minute, I think I recognize some of those issues in my, in my kid. Well, the action item is to bring it up with a pediatrician, bring it up with a pediatric dentist, bring it up with a healthcare professional and say, what do these mean? And, and so it's very valuable that way, I think. And they, they like that there. And then so they came to Kevin and I, and they said, we want to do another brochure. So we're hoping uh, that soon next year, there'll be a nutrition brochure. Won't that be interesting? And so Kevin Kevin wrote a great brochure. I helped a little bit of it that now we got, now it's in the hands of the scientists to see if we're, you know, not using those B and S words. And, uh, and so... <laughs> <laughs> and so we'll have a nutrition brochure to go along with a children's airway brochure. And, to, and uh, so big ADA really, really wants to be a good supporter of us taking care of these children and really all ages, but of course, children uh, for getting them on the right track, getting their health span started off correctly. So the president, um, you know, the present president of the ADA, Steve, how long is his tenure term? I want him to stay in office forever. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's so supportive. Sadly, it's a year, but coming right behind him is a woman who I've known for 33 years. And and Linda uh, Edgar is, is going to be a great president as well. Uh, oh. she She's a, just a, a wonderful person uh, to, to follow up with George. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And just a, a follow up question to the brochure. That's helpful. Dr. Boyd, how do you suggest people approach this to the pediatrician? Because it's, um, you know, that there could be so much movement with the medical community. Every, I got yeah. about 10 questions just on that alone. Well, I've, I've come up with something. You know, even though you, you're qualified, you feel qualified, maybe you are qualified, do not make referrals to other collaborators, ENTs, sleep medicine doctors, allergists. Don't take that upon yourself. It's an opportunity to engage the PCP. So if you have a child in your practice that you feel would benefit from an ENT consult, from an allergy consult, from a sleep medicine consult, from a psych consult, contact the PCP, the primary care physician, which is usually a pediatrician or maybe a family physician, and write them a letter. I've got a form letter. I'll share it with anybody. Dear PCP, our mutual patient. Most physicians, pediatricians, think you're a dentist, you fill cavities. They will say, oh yeah, of course you do more than that, but they don't think that. And it's up to you to let them know we have a mutual patient, a mutual concern, and I don't want to make a decision about, in, in some places you can't do it, you won't get coverage. If the insurance requires the PCP sign on. Well, even if they, you know, that's not the issue, it's just a professional time thing to do, to involve the PCP. You know what? If you send a letter, it has to go on their medical chart. And you can know I went on record. I contacted the PCP. They didn't respond. So I will make the referral now. But I tried to get a hold of your pediatrician. You know, And all of a sudden, you, you got a pediatrician who knows you do more than fill teeth. Filling teeth is important, <laughs> but, you know, you do other things. That's how you let them know. And it's the best for the kid. So much. I think a lot of the questions were answered in your presentations. And a lot of the questions were about technical, the how-to technique um, 
part of it that I'm going to go over really quickly in our upcoming courses. Uh, but I just want to talk about the CE. Some people are asking about that. We It's logged on Zoom. So we'll see your attendance and you need to be in attendance for the full program and you will be emailed this by the end of next week. It takes us a little bit of time to make up the certificate. So um, circle back and make sure you have our, our email info at Airway Health Solutions in your contact so we don't wind up in your spam. Um, we learned a lot about clear aligners with the finishing of the cases. I just want to let you know this is timely because we have a new course. It's going to be this Friday uh, with Dr. Ben Moralia on, on really talking about expansion philosophies and integrating this simply into your, um, into your office. There is a coupon that we will send out in the email. So everything I'm telling you will be in our follow-up email. And our mini residencies is where Dr. Moralia teaches the techniques. So these are all technique courses. So when you leave the course, you'll be able to do the tried and true techniques that Dr. Moralia has been doing over the last uh, 20 years or so. And he really breaks it down simply and efficiently so you can integrate it. We have plenty of testimonials on it. A lot of people on the call are alumni, which is now part of our family. Uh, we have ongoing support and uh, we really encourage you. If you wanna take a first step, it would really be attending a pediatric residency with Dr. Ben Moralia. And then uh, Dr. Boyd's course is an advanced course because we want you to have that uh, baseline knowledge that Dr. Moralia teaches. Dr. Boyd actually took Dr. Moralia's course and then makes it a prerequisite uh, for his course. So um, hopefully you can join us. It's going to be live in Florida. It's also live streamed. Um, that's October 7th and 8th. And we do have a mini residency that's live with Ben Moralia uh, the day before October 6th. So again, this is all on our email. I just want to make sure we bring this to the forefront. Um, one of the questions that came up were that um, everyone thinks braces are, are bad. And um, Ben, you just want to chime in a little bit here because in your advanced courses, you do teach uh, an expansive technique with bracket wires. And just, there's just a lot of confusion about clear aligners and uh, braces in adults. You just want to just touch on that really quickly. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, generally braces are retractive and there's... Um... Uh, a very good chance if you're using brackets and wires alone at the age of 12 to 15, you are going to experience a retractive uh, technique and you will not develop any width. You will remain narrow and have straight front teeth. And that was you know, shown in the few cases we had here today. But the idea behind brackets and wires existing in an expansive technique would be appropriate if you learned your bracket and wire technique after you develop the full foundation. So anytime that we teach in this advanced course about brackets and wires, it is first, the foundation was fully developed. So depending upon the age you meet that child, and it doesn't matter what age, into the teens even, we do our expander technique first, we deliver the full foundation. Once you have the full foundation, you have a pathway to use either clear aligners or brackets and wires, but the brackets and wires are very specific. They are self-ligating brackets. The arch wires are broad arch wires, so they are a fully developed arch wire that will represent a human being as they should be shaped, not straight back, because a wire that goes straight back gives you straight front teeth and a narrow arch and no tongue space. So when you're using self-ligating brackets with a set of wires that are called broad arch or extra large or extra wide, that, that is a wonderful expansive technique, but it's secondary to foundational development. So I don't really have an example in 20 years of using braces alone. Braces alone have nothing or no effect on the foundation. So we develop the foundation first. And then afterwards, because we do have teens to work on, not all of them can use clear aligners well. So while I do a lot of clear aligner technique, we have a handful of mixed dentition and teenagers that need some bracket and wire technique. Post foundational development, self ligating brackets, broad arch wires can be wider and forward as well. And we teach that. You wouldn't necessarily see it from the ortho community because generally they're doing brackets and wires alone and using arch wires that go straight back and using those little twin brackets that the wire goes in and the cell ligatures go around. And that is generally a retractive technique. It, it accepts the underdeveloped arch and just tries to straighten the teeth. So that's not where you get expansive technique from. So I'm happy to teach it to anybody who wants to listen. And brackets and wires that are self-ligating and used after foundational development can be an expansive technique. And I show you how to do it. Thank can you. I, you just did I another on, that. on on the expansive uh, orthodontics. Um, you there is hardly any companies out there that make the wire to what we want the patient to go to, because they're using old technology and small arches. And so what we have on every single one of our um, parts is we have a template 
where we take the wire and we we form the wire to the shape and the size that we want that patient to get to. Don't just take it out of the box and put it in the patient because it's going to be retractive and, and it's going to um, have relapse. You've got to develop the wires. Um, and if I could find a company that would develop the wires and make them as wide as I want to, then it would be a lot easier. But right now, I, I don't know of any of those companies. So we, on every single patient, we go in and we form those wires to fit the patient that we want to so that we're getting expansive orthodontics. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Uh, we have our Mayo courses that we love. Um, Brittany Sierra Murphy and uh, Carice Laguerre, they are amazing, passionate, and really effective teachers that really put all their heart and soul and experience into it. So check, check out our Mayo page. And we're so excited to have our first um, airway orthodontic mini residency with an orthodontist. So perhaps there are orthodontists who want a peer-to-peer -peer learning. This is open to all um, uh, dentists and orthodontists, and this is gonna be September 29th. Dr. Christensen, you have so many pearls to teach. I cannot wait for this mini residency. Everyone will come out learning something new. Do you just wanna give us a high level overview on, cause I know this is your first course with us about your excitement of this course. Well, my goal is um, in teaching this course is that after this course, I mean, it's hard to teach, uh, you know, how to be an orthodontist in one day, but we've uh, been um, putting together short video clips of every little step of way, uh, along the way of what you need to do. This is how you do this part. Here's a video. This is how you do this part. This is how you do it. Um, and uh, a lot of the different ways of, of uh, maxillary mandibular growth and development, mandibular growth and development with, uh, you know, um, different appliances that help the mandible to grow forward. Um, I don't know. I'm, and, and I'm glad you're saying this is open to general dentists. Unfortunately, um, there's very few of us orthodontists that are open to this. And um, we cannot rely on the orthodontic community to save our kids. And so we, we have to train the, the general dentist to, um, to be the orthodontist. And if you're not comfortable- Pediatric with, dentist and the pediatric dentist, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Every, everybody. I mean, all of us sure. that are in, in the dental field, we, we, we're all accountable for this stuff. Well, we look forward to this course. And I love that picture of you. You look so cool there. So <laughs> nice one. Um, and then we also have our, our course with Dr. Gelb about TMD to ortho. Um, it's like the, it's the prequel, if you would, if they have an acute TMD patient, uh, you can get them out of pain and then get them into orthodontics. So that's 100% virtual October 20th. I know all of our panelists um, are so excited here about Airway Palooza. We were there last year. It was such a, a wonderful two days of learning. Day one is pediatrics, day two is adults. It's for everyone involved in one in, in airway health who really want to make a difference. It's so inspiring and you'll just come back feeling uh, regenerated. And we really look forward to, to a great turnout like we did sold out last year. So don't delay because I know the flights are limited to that weekend in March, March 15th, 16th. Uh, so we'll send you some coupons to follow up. We, we won't read through this. You'll get that in your email. And we are super excited because we just had a press release yesterday that Airway Health Solutions is now partnering with the Children's Airway First Foundation. I was so inspired by Candy Sparks and her team and her story literally brought everyone to tears that I knew I needed to get more involved personally, just my personal mission. Um, so luckily I have Airway Health Solutions to also bring into the mix, but I'm so excited to work with them and so so proud to newly be on their, on their board. It's such a huge honor that I can't wait to work with Rebecca, who I know is watching tonight and really, really make a difference. We have some great ideas. And um, uh, Dr. Carsonson, you inspired me with your dream big and the set goals and the actions. I can't wait to share out what we have in store. So stay tuned on that one. I wonder what's going to happen five years from now. <laughs> we'll have to have another uh, celebration of some kind. Here's that co calibration, uh, collaboration cures. We do have a $200 coupon code. Uh, that'll also be in the email. So be sure to use that. We also put it in the chat. And um, we're going to have our AHS fifth birthday raffle. Uh, but before we do that, I'm just going to stop sharing. Hold on. <laughs> if I can uh, just see my... I'm going to stop sharing the screen, which is always hidden. Okay, great. 
And I just wanted to personally um, thank everybody for being on this journey with me from AOA Health Solutions. Again, five years ago, it was all a dream. It was an idea and it was action. And Dr. Morali and I came together and said, we have to get this information out to the masses. Everyone has that aha moment. What do you do with it? That's the next question. You don't have to have a company, AOA Health Solutions. You can do your part in your small area of the world. You can start with a group din dinner, peer to peer, just getting excited. But we are so proud and we couldn't have done uh, what we've done without you. And um, before I wanted to show our, our fifth video um, anniversary celebration. But before I do, Dr. Morali, I want to come off mute and um, share with us your thoughts about Airway Health Solutions' fifth birthday. Yeah, you know, thank you, Lori. It has been an unbelievable journey. I couldn't believe it was five because I, I feel like we just started this, you know, and it has, it, I, I, I really can't wrap my head around five years. But I'm thinking about what is an appropriate five-year birthday gift. And it's like a bicycle. So at five years old, you get a little bicycle, right? And yeah. shortly thereafter, because from five, that bicycle might come with training wheels. <laughs> but I think by six, you're supposed to take those off. So I'm expecting that the AHS little world we're building and this whole collaborative and the gang that we've got together, we should be able to take the training wheels off in a year. And I believe that with the training wheels off, we should really start flying soon. So I'm, I'm excited Absolutely. about what's happened in five years. I can't believe the exposure and the, you know, the open arms, the open minds, the welcomeness to this information and helping a child earlier. And uh, I'm really excited about the next five, but even in the next one, I think we should start to see more of an exponential ramp in the transition from tooth focused to foundation focused. And when we go from tooth focused to foundation focused, the dental community and its collaborative care members are going to start healing the children and then you can have the good teeth and nice teeth too. Nobody wants to take away working on the teeth. I'm not trying to take that away from anybody, but we, we need to be foundation focused first and then tooth second, then you get healthy oral cavity, healthy child. So I'm really excited about going forward. Happy birthday, AHS and its community. Five years, blink of an eye. Let's get the training wheels off and get this thing rolling. With that, let's take a, a preview about our with our birthday video and just see what we've been up to. And thanks everyone for your support. And then we'll do the raffle, I promise. <laughs>
you know, it's just a, a, a it's wonderful to see. It's 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 the kind of inspiration that we all need to have from time to time. So that video needs to be played from you know on the dark days, on the days when things aren't going well, on the days when we need a little pick me up. Play that and 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 smile, and then that'll that'll build for the next several years. So congratulations, guys. Thank you. And I'm going to take away his name is today. <laughs> you know, I love that one. Hashtag his name is today. Um, Dr. Boy and Dr. Christensen, you want to say something real quick? Because I didn't want to leave you out. <laughs> Brad, go ahead. I'm, I'm, a, I'm so excited to be part of this. Um, you know, my, my journey started about five years ago without you guys. And then um, uh, you guys found me and pulled me into it. And um, I, I'm, I'm so excited for the next five years, the next 10 years. Um, I, if it wasn't for a forum like this, um, how would we get to everybody? Because um, the dental schools and, and that are not grabbing this and going, we've got to train everybody. So thank you for doing this. This is super exciting. I'm excited for everything in the future. So I got to say, um, 10, 12 years ago, uh, AAPMD, NYU, and I heard Ben talking, and I'm like, who is this guy? And kind of lost touch with him. And I don't know, a couple of years ago, I happened, somebody sent me a link to one of Ben's talks. And it's like, oh my God, like who, this is incredible. This is a guy I met 10 years ago. So I thought, I got to let him know I want to be part of his deal. I mean, I, I don't know. I just thought he might not remember me anything. And then he's telling people I'm his mentor. And it's like, and then I said, Ben, I want to teach preschool and you can do elementary school and high school. And then I get a call from Lauren and it's like, I, I really didn't think I could become part of this, of what you guys had put together. And I wasn't even trying to be. I just wanted to let you guys know what you're doing is so cool. And then they invited me into their realm. And the rest is history. I am so proud to be part of AHS. And I just, Ben, you know, you call me a mentor. You are my mentor. Oh, this is just like, come full circle so oh, you I'm, can feel I'm, the love, I'm right? happy yeah. you, everybody. <laughs> yeah. right uh, it's such a great evening thank you so much um to all the panelists and thank you everybody for attending we are going to go do our raffle to see who wins the free virtual ticket to airway palooza um i'm gonna have gerald uh, i want to thank gerald um as well for being the director of operations he likes to be behind the scenes so he doesn't like any attention but we couldn't do what we do without gerald and also my son james kilmead who does all our social media content we're a small but mighty crowd so let's go ahead and see who wins the lucky virtual palooza ticket you have to be in attendance to win so we just have to verify all right let's spin the wheel Cute as this. Wow. Joseph Angolia. Is Joseph Angolia in the house? Let's confirm. Lucky let's Joe. See. Congratulations, Joe. I hope he's still on. Yeah, let's see. Is he in the house? Uh let's see in the chat. Gerald, can you just chat if he's let's see if he's in. Let me go to I. Here, there it is. He's here. <laughs> Yay! He's in there. You got a oh, right. dollar value. So if you want to join us live, let me know and we can work something out. But if not, you just want a virtual ticket. You're going to get a great education from top experts. And we're so thrilled um, to be offering this tonight. So we are only five minutes over. I am so impressed because there was so much to share. And I do believe we met our goals about raising, uh, raising airway health awareness, orthodontic health awareness.
busting some myths um, that make you just think a little bit more. And that's really what we just want to do is provoke some um, thought provoking mm -hmm. uh, questions and you can come up with your own judgments. Now, when you have the answers, your own personal answers, do something about it. Reach out to us. We'd be more than happy, happy to help you um, in any way we can. We will always provide these free uh, awareness um, offerings. We expect more of it with our alliance with CAF now and uh, we couldn't be prouder. This is recorded, so this will be um, available for everybody uh, who registered, and then it'll be shortly on YouTube, so you can share this with all your colleagues, your teams, have lunch and learns, talk about this. You know, this is really uh, thought-provoking material and makes you ask why, and then more importantly is how can you make the difference? So be the change you wanna see. Thank you, everybody. Can't, I really love you all and really appreciate everything you do. Until next time, we will have more free events. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you all very much.